Act One of Love and a Bottle by George Farquhar. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dedication To the Right Honorable Peregrine, Lord Marquis of Carmarthen, etc. My Lord, being equally a stranger to your lordship and the whole nobility of this kingdom something of a natural impulse and aspiring motion in my inclinations has prompted me though i hazard a presumption to declare my respect and be the success how it will i am vain of nothing in this place but the choice of my patron i shall be so far thought a judicious author whose principal business is to design his works in offering to the greatest honor and merit i cannot hear my lord stand accused of any sort of adulation but to myself because compliments due to merit return upon the giver and the only flattery is to myself whilst i attempt your lordship's praise i dare make no essay on your lordship's youthful bravery and courage because such is always guarded with modesty but shall venture to present you some lines on this subject which the world will undoubtedly apply to your lordship courage the highest gift that scorns to bend to mean devices for a sordid end courage an independent spark from heaven's bright throne by which the soul stands raised triumphant high alone great in itself not praises of the crowd above all vice it stoops not to be proud courage the mighty attribute of powers above by which those great in war are great in love the spring of all brave acts is seated here as falsehoods draw their sordid birth from fear the best and noblest part of mankind pay homage to royalty what veneration then is due to those virtues and endowments which even engage the respect of royalty itself in the person of one of the greatest emperors in the world who chose your lordship not only as a companion but a conductor he wasted the fire of such a briton to animate his cold russians and would therefore choose you his leader in war as in travel he knew the fury of the turk could be only stopped by an english nobleman as the power of france was by an english king a sense of this greatness which might deter others animates me to address your lordship resolved that my first muse should take a high and daring flight i aspire to your lordship's protection for this trifle which i must own myself now proud of affording me this opportunity of humbly declaring myself my lord your lordship's most devoted servant g farquhar dramatis personae roback an irish gentleman of a wild roving temper newly come to london read by l g pag lovewell his friend sober and modest in love with lucinda read by todd Mockmode, a young squire, come newly from the university, and setting up for a bow. Read by Thomas Peter. Lyric, a poet, read by Jason in Panama. Pamphlet, a bookseller, read by Abai. Brigadoon, a dancing master, read by Son of the Exiles. Nimble wrist, a fencing master read by kurt club servant to mock mode read by trisha g brush servant to love oil read by craig franklin lucinda a lady of considerable fortune read by lian yao lianthi sister to lovewell in love with roebuck and disguised as lucinda's page read by sonia trudge whore to roebuck Read by Linda Olsen Feitak. Widow Bullfinch, Landlady to Mahmoud Lyric and Trudge. Read by T.J. Burns. Pendris, Attendant and Confidant to Lucinda. Read by Jesse Percival. Bailiff Number One. Read by Roger Moline. Bailiff Two. Read by Larry Wilson. Cripples. Read by Alan Mapstone. Porter, read by Owen Cook. Boy, read by Larry Wilson. 
Mask One, read by Nemo. Second Mask, read by Sandra. Servant, read by Eva Davis. Stage Directions, read by Tom Penn. Scene, London. Prologue, by J. H., spoken by Mr. Powell. A servant attending with a bottle of wine. As stubborn atheists, who disdain to pray, repent, though late, upon their dying day, so in their pangs most authors racked with fears implore your mercy in our suppliant prayers. But our new author has no cause maintained. Let him not lose what he has never gained. Love and a bottle are his peaceful arms. Ladies and gallants, have not these some charms? For love, all mankind to the fair must sue, and, sirs, the bottle he presents to you. Health to the play. Drinks. Even let it fairly pass. Sure none sit here that will refuse their glass. Oh, there's a damning soldier. Let me think. He looks as he were sworn to what? To drink. Drinks. Come on, then. Foot to foot be boldly set and our young author's new commission wet. He and his bottle here attend their doom. From you the poet's helicon must come. If he has any foes to make amends, he gives his service. Drinks. Sure you now are friends. No critic here will he provoke to fight. The day be theirs. He only begs his night. Pray pledge him now, secured from all abuse. The name the health you love, let none refuse. But each man's mistress be the poet's muse. Love and a Bottle Act One, Scene One Lincoln's Inn Fields Enter Roebuck repeating the following line. Thus far our arms have with success been crowned. <laughs> Heroically spoken, faith, of a fellow that has not one farthing in his pocket. If I have one penny to buy a halter with all in my present necessity, may I be hanged, though I am reduced to a fair way of obtaining one methodically very soon, if robbery or theft will purchase the gallows. But hold, can't I rob honourably by turning soldier? Enter Cripple begging. One farthing for the poor old soldier. For the Lord's sake. Ah, a glimpse of damnation, just as a man is entering into sin, is no great policy of the devil. But how long did you bear arms, friend? Five years, and please you, sir. And how long has that honourable crutch borne you? Fifteen, sir. Very pretty. Five years, a soldier. And fifteen a beggar. This is hell right. An age of damnation for a momentary offence. Thy condition, fellow, is preferable to mine. The merciful bullet, more kind than thy ungrateful country, has given thee an adventure in thy broken leg, from which thou canst draw a more plentiful maintenance than I from all my limbs in perfection. Prithee, friend, why wouldst thou beg of me? Just think I'm rich? No, sir, and therefore I believe you charitable. Your warm fellows are so far above the sense of our misery that they can't pity us, and I have always found it by sad experience as needless to beg of a rich man as of a clergyman. Our greatest benefactors, the brave officers, are all disbanded, and must now turn beggars like myself. And so, times are very hard, sir. What? Are the soldiers more charitable than the clergy? Aye, sir. A captain will say, damn me, and give me sixpence. And a parson shall whine out, God bless me, and give me not a farthing. Now I think the officer's blessing match the best. 
Are the bow never compassionate? The great four wigs they wear stop their ears so close that they can't hear us. And if they should, they never have any farthings about them. Then I am a bow, friend. Therefore, pray leave me. Begging from a generous soul that has not to bestow is more tormenting than robbery to a miser in his abundance. Prithee, friend, be thou charitable for once. I beg only the favour which rich friends bestow. A little advice. I am as poor as thou art, and am designing to turn soldier. No, no, sir. See what an honourable post I'm forced to stand to. My rags are scarecrows sufficient to frighten any one from the field. Rather turn bird of prey at home. Showing his crutch. Grum mercy, O oh, devil. I find hell has its pimps of the poorer sort, as well as those of the wealthy. I fancy, friend, thou hast got a cloven foot instead of a broken leg. Tis a hard case that a man must never expect to go nearer heaven than some steps of a ladder, but tis unavoidable. I have my wants to lead and the devil to drive, and if I can't meet my friend Lovewell, which I think impossible, being so great a stranger in town, Fortune, thou hast done thy worst. I proclaim open war against thee. I'll stab thy next rich darling that I see, and killing him, be thus revenged on thee. Retires to the back part of the stage, as into the walks, making some turns across the stage in disorder. Exit Cripple. Enter Lucinda and Pendrus. Oh, these summer mornings are so delicately fine, Pendrus. It does me good to be abroad. Ay, madam, these summer mornings are as pleasant to young folks as the winter nights to married people, or as your morning of beauty to Mr. Lovewell. I'm violently afraid the evening of my beauty will fall to his share very soon, for I am inclinable to marry him. I shall soon lie under an eclipse, Pindrus. Then it must be full moon with your ladyship, but why would you choose to marry in summer, madam? I know no cause, but that people are apt us to run mad in hot weather, unless you take a woman's reason. What's that, madam? Why, I am weary of lying alone. Oh, dear madam, lying alone is very dangerous. Tis apt to breed strange dreams. I had the oddest dream last night of my courtier that is to be, Squire Mockmode. He appeared crowded about with a dancing master, pushing master, music master, and all the throng of bow-makers, and methought he had mimicked foppery so awkwardly that his imitation was downright burlesquing it. I burst out a-laughing so heartily that I wakened myself. But dreams go by contraries, madam. Have you not seen him yet? No. But my uncle's letter gives account that he's newly come to town from the university, where his education could reach no farther than to guzzle fat ale, smoke tobacco, and chop logic. Oh, it makes me sick. But he's very rich, madam. His concerns join to yours in the country. Aye, but his concerns shall never join to mine in the city. For since I had the disposal of my own fortune, Lovewell is the man for my money. Aye, and for my money, for I've had above twenty pieces from him since his courtship began. He's the prettiest, sober gentleman, and I have so strong an opinion of his modesty that I'm afraid, madam, your first child will be a fool. Oh, God forbid! I hope a lawyer understands business better than to beget anything non compos The walks fill apace, the enemy approaches. We must set out our false colours. Put on their masks. We masks are the purest privateers. Madam? How would you like to cruise about a little? Well enough. Had we no enemy but our fops and sits. But I dread these blustering men of war, the officers, who, after a broadside of dams and sink knees, are for boarding all masks they meet as lawful prize. In truth, madam, and most of them are lawful prize, for they generally have French wear under hatches. Oh, hideous! Oh, my conscience, girl! 
thou art quite spoiled an actress upon the stage would blush at such expressions ay madam and your ladyship would seem to blush in the box when the redness of your face proceeded from nothing but the constraint of holding your laughter did you chide me for not putting a stronger lace in your stays when you had broke one as strong as a hempen cord with containing a violent tee-hee at a smutty jest in the last play go go thou art a naughty girl thy impertinent chat has diverted us from our business I'm afraid Lovewell has missed us for want of the sign. But whom have we here? An odd figure. Some gentleman in disguise, I believe. Had he a finer suit on, I should believe him in disguise, for I fancy his friends have only known him by that this twelve month. His mien and air show him a gentleman, and his clothes demonstrate him a wit. He may afford us some sport. I have a female inclination to talk to him. Hold, madam he looks as like one of those dangerous men of war you just now mentioned as can be you had best send out your pinnace before to discover the enemy no i'll hail him myself moves towards roebuck what sir dreaming slaps him on the shoulder with her fan roebuck sullenly yes madam of what of the devil and now my dreams out what do you dream standing Yes, faith lady, very often when my sleep's haunted by such pretty goblins as you. You are a sort of dream I would fain be reading. I'm a very good interpreter indeed, madam. Are you then one of the wise men of the East? No, madam, but one of the fools of the West. Pray, what do you mean by that? An Irishman, madam, at your service. Oh, horrible! An Irishman! A mere wolf-dog, I protest! Been surprised, child. The wolf-dog is as well-natured an animal as any of your country bulldogs, and a much more fawning creature, let me tell ye. Lays hold of her. Pray, good Caesar, keep off your paws. No scraping acquaintance, for heaven's sake. Tell us some news of your country. I have heard the strangest stories that the people wear horns and hoofs. Yes, Feath, a great many wear horns, but we had that, among other laudable fashions, from London. I think it came over with your mode of wearing high top knots, for ever since the men and the wives bear their heads exalted alike. They were both fashions that took wonderfully. Then you have ladies among you? Yes, yes, we have ladies and whores, colleges and playhouses, churches and taverns, fine houses and bawdy houses, in short, everything that you can boast of, but fops, poets, toads, and adders. But have you no beau at all? Yes, they come over like the woodcocks, once a year. And have your ladies no springes to cash them in? No, madam. Our own country affords us much better wildfowl, but they are generally stripped of their feathers by the playhouse and taverns, in both which they pretend to be critics, and our ignorant nation imagines a full wig as infallible a token of a wit as the laurel. Oh, Lord! And here tis the certain sign of a blockhead. But why no poets in Ireland, sir? Faith, madam, I know not. Unless St. Patrick sent them up backing with the other venomous creatures out of Ireland. Nothing that carries a sting in its tongue can live there. But since I have described my country, let me know a little of England by sight of your face. Come you to particulars first. Pray, sir, unmask by telling who you are. And then I'll unmask and show who I am. You must distinguish your attendants then, madam. What a distinguishing particular of me is a secret. Sir, I can keep a secret as well as my mistress, and the greater the secrets are, I love them the better. Can't they be whispered, sir? Oh, yes, madam. I can give you a hint by which you may understand them. Pretends to whisper and kisses her. Sir, you're impudent! Nay, madam. Since you are so good at minding folks, 
have with you catches her fast carrying her off help 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 enter lovewell brush following villain unhand the lady and defend thyself draws what thy errands in this country no has the devil very opportunely set me a throat to quit pray heaven his pockets be well lined quits lucinda who goes off with pendrus have at thee st george for england they fight after some passes roebuck starts back and pauses ha huh. my friend lovewell my dear roebuck fling down their swords and embrace shall i believe my eyes you may believe your ears tis i by god why thy being in london is such a mystery that i must have the evidence of more senses in one to confirm me of its truth but pray unfold the riddle why faith tis a riddle you wonder at it before the explanation then wonder more at yourself for not guessing it what is the universal cause of the continued evils of mankind the universal cause of our continued evil is the devil sure no tis the flesh ned that very woman that drove us all out of paradise has sent me a packing out of ireland how so only tasting the forbidden fruit that was all is simple fornication become so great a crime there as to be punishable by no less than banishment egad mine was double fornication ned the jade was so pregnant to bear twins the fruit grew in clusters and my unconscionable father because i was a rogue in debauching her would make me a fool by wedding her but i would not marry a whore and he would not own a disobedient son and so but was she a gentlewoman Psha! no she had no fortune she wore indeed a silk manteau and high head but these are grown as little signs of gentility nowadays as that is of chastity but what necessity forced you to leave the kingdom i will tell you to shun the insulting authority of an incensed father the dull and often repeated advice of impertinent relations the continual clamours of a furious woman and the shrill bawling of an ill-natured bastard from all which good lord deliver me and so you left them to granddada <laughs> heaven was pleased to lessen my affliction by taking away the she brat but the other is i hope well because a brave boy whom i christened edward after thee love well i made bold to make my man stand for you and your sister sent her maid to give her a name to my daughter now you talk of my sister pray how does she dear lovewell a very miracle of beauty and goodness but i don't like her why she's virtuous and i think beauty and virtue are as ill-joined as lewdness and ugliness but i hope your arguments could not make her a proselyte to this profession faith i endeavoured it but that plaguey honour damn it for a whim were it as honourable for women to be whores as men to be her masters we should have lewdness as great a mark of quality among the ladies as tis now among the lords what do you hold no innate principle of virtue in women we hold an innate principle of love in them their passions are as great as ours their reason weaker we admire them and consequently they must us and i beg to tell thee once more that had women no safeguard but your innate principle of virtue honest george roebuck would have lain with your sister ned and should enjoy a countess before night but methinks george twas not fair to tempt my sister methinks twas not fair of thy sister ned to tempt me as she was thy sister i had no design upon her but as she's a pretty woman i could scarcely forbear her were she my own but upon serious reflection could not you have lived better at home by turning thy whore into a wife than here by turning other men's wives into whores there are merchant ladies in london and you must trade with them for aught i see ay but is the trade open 
is the manufacturer encouraged old boy oh wonderfully a great many poor people live by it though the husbands are for engrossing the trade the wives are altogether for encouraging interlopers but i hope you have brought some small stock to set up with robach aside the greatness of my wants which would force me to discover em makes me blush to own em aloud why faith ned i had a great journey from ireland hither and would burden myself with no more than just necessary charges oh then you have brought bills no faith exchange of money from dublin hither is so unreasonable high that what that thunes i have not one farthing no you understand me no faith i never understand one that comes in forma pauperis i haven't studied the law so long for nothing but what prospect can you propose of a supply i'll tell you when you appeared i was just thanking my stars for sending me a throat to cut and consequently a purse but my knowledge of you prevented me of that way and therefore i think you're obliged in return to assist me by some better means you were once an honest fellow but so long study in the ends may alter a man strangely as you say no dear roebuck i'm still a friend to thy virtues and esteem thy follies as foils only to set them off i did but rally you and to convince you here are some pieces share of what i have about me take them as earnest of my father's supply you know my estate sufficient to maintain us both if you will either restrain your extravagancies or i retrench my necessaries the profession of kindness is so great that i could almost suspect it of design but come friend i am heartily tired with the fatigue of my journey besides a violent fit of sickness which detained me a month at coventry to the exhausting my health and money let me only recruit by a relish of the tone in love and a bottle and then as they are going off, Roebuck starts back, surprised. Oh, heavens and earth! What's the matter, man? Why, death and the devil! Oh, what's worse, a woman and a child! Oons! Oh, don't you see Mrs. Trudge with my bastard in her arms crossing the field towards us? Oh, the indefatigable whore to follow me all the way to London! Mrs. Trudge? my old acquaintance ay ay the very same your old acquaintance and for aught i know you might have clubbed about getting the brats tis but reasonable then i should pay share at the reckoning i'll help to provide for her in the meantime you had best retire brush conduct this gentleman to my lodgings and run from thence to widow bullfinch's and provide a lodging with her for a friend of mine fly and come back presently Exeunt Roebuck and Brush. So my friend comes to town like the great Turk to the field, attended by his concubines and children, and I'm afraid these are but parts of his retinue. But hold, I shan't be able to sustain the shock of this woman's fury. I'll withdraw till she has discharged her first volley, then surprise her. Retires behind. Enter Trudge with child crying. Hush, hush, hush. And indeed, it was a young traveller. And what would it say? It says that Daddy is a false man, a cruel man, and an ungrateful man. In troth, so he is, my dear child. What shall I do with it, poor creature? Hush, hush, hush! Was ever poor woman in such a lamentable condition? immediately after the pains of one travail to undergo the fatigues of another but i'm sure he can never do well for though i can't find him my curses and the misery of this babe will certainly reach him lovewell coming forward methinks i should know that voice what mrs trudge and in london whose brave boy hast thou got there oh lord mr lovewell i'm very glad to see you and yet i'm ashamed to see you but indeed he promised to marry me 
and you know mr lovewell that he's such a handsome man and has so many ways of insinuating that the frailty of women's nature could not resist him what's all this a handsome man ways of insinuating frailty of nature i don't understand these ambiguous terms ah mr lovewell i'm sure you have seen mr roebuck and i'm sure twould be the first thing he would tell you i'll refer it to you mr lovewell if he is not an ungrateful man to deal so barbarously with any woman that had used him so civilly i was kinder to him than i would have been to me own born brother oh then i find kissing goes by favour mrs trudge faith you're all alike you men are all alike poor child he's as like his own dad as if he were spit out of his mouth see mr lovewell if he has not mr roebuck's nose to a hair and you know he has a very good nose and the little pig's knee has mamma's mouth oh the little lips and tis the best-natured little dear <laughs> snuggles and kisses it and would it ask its godfather blessing indeed mr lovewell i believe the child knows you <laughs> well i will give it my blessing gives it gold re-enter lucinda and pendrus who seeing the others instantly abscond come madam i'll first settle you in a lodging and then find the false man as you call him exit with trudge lucinda coming forward the false man is found already was there ever such a lucky discovery my care for his preservation brought me back and now behold how my kindness is returned their fighting was a downright trick to frighten me from the place thereby to afford him opportunity of entertaining his whore and brat your conjecture madam bears a colour for looking back i could perceive him talking very familiarly so that they could not be strangers as their pretended quarrel would intimate tis all true as he is false what slighted despised my honourable love trucked for a whore oh villain epitome of thy sex but i'll be revenged I'll marry the first man that asks me the question. Nay, though he be a disbanded soldier, or a poor poet, or a senseless fop. Nay, though impotent, I'll marry him. Oh, madam, that's to be revenged on yourself. I care not, fool. I deserve punishment for my credulity, as much as he for his falsehood. And you deserve it too, minx. Your persuasions drew me to this assignation. I never loved the false man. Pendrus, aside. That's false, I'm sure. But you thought to get another piece of gold. We shall have him giving you money on the same score he was so liberal to his whore just now. Walks about in a passion. Re-enter Lovewell, brush following. So much for friendship. Now for my love. I haven't transgressed much. Oh, there she is. Oh, my angel. Runs to Lucinda. Oh, thou devil! Starts back. Not unless you damn me, madam. You're damned already. You're a man. Exit, pushing Pendrus. You're a woman, I'll be sworn. Hey, day, what giddy female planet rules now? By the Lord, these women are like their maidenheads, no sooner found than lost. Here, Brush, run after Pendrus and know the occasion of this. Stay, come back. Soons, I'm a fool. That's the first wise word you have spoken these two months. Trouble me with your untimely jest, sirrah, and I'll... Your pardon, sir, I'm in downright earnest. Aside. Tis less slavery to be apprenticed to a famous clap surgeon than to a lover. He falls out with me because he can't fall in with his mistress. I can bear it no longer. Sirrah, what are you mumbling? A short prayer before I depart, sir. I have been these three years your servant, but now, sir, I'm your humble servant. Bows as going. Hold, you shan't leave me. Sir, 
you can't be my master. Why so? Because you're not your own master. Yet one would think you might, for you have lost your mistress. Oon, sir, let her go, and a fair riddance. Who throws away a tester and a mistress loses sixpence. That little pimping Cupid is a blind gunner. Had he shot as many darts as I have carried Billet's dough, he would have laid her kicking with her heels up here now. In short, sir, my patience is worn to the stumps with attending. My shoes and stockings are upon their last legs with trudging between you. I have sweat out all my moisture of my hand with palming your clammy letters upon her. I have... Hold, sir. Your trouble is now at an end, for I design to marry her. And have you courted her these three years for nothing but a wife? Do you think, rascal, I would have taken so much pains to make her a miss? No, sir. The tenth part on would have done. But if you are resolved to marry, God be we. What's the matter now, sirrah? Why, the matter will be that I must then pimp for her. Hark ye, sir, what have you been doing all this while but teaching her the way to cuckold ye? Take care, sir. Look before you leap. You have a ticklish point to manage. Can you tell, sir, what's her quarrel to you now? I can't imagine. I don't remember that ever I offended her. That's it, sir. She resolves to put your easiness to the test now, that she may, with more security, rely upon it hereafter. Always suspect those women of designs that are for searching into the humours of their courtiers, for they certainly intend to try them when they're married. How camest thou such an engineer in love? I have sprung some minds in my time, sir, and since I have trudged so long about your amorous messages, I have more intrigue in the sole of my feet than some blockheads in their whole body. Sirrah, have you ever discovered any behaviour in this lady to occasion this suspicious discourse? Sir, has this lady ever discovered any behaviour of yours to occasion this suspicious quarrel? I believe the lady has as much of the innate principle of virtue, as the gentleman said, as any woman. But that baggage, her attendant, is about ravishing her lady's page every hour. Tis an old saying, like master, like man. Why not as well, like mistress, like maid? Lovewell, aside. Since thou art for trying humours, have with you, Madam Lucinda. Besides, so fair an opportunity offers, that faith seemed to design it. Aloud. Have you left the gentleman at my lodgings? Yes, sir, and sent a porter to his inn to bring his things thither. That's right. Love, like other diseases, must sometimes have a desperate cure. The school of Venus imposes the strict discipline. An awful Cupid is a chastening god. He whips severely. No, not if we kiss the rod. Exeunt. End of Act One. Act Two of Love and a Bottle by George Farquhar. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two, Scene One, Lovewell's Lodgings. Enter Lovewell, Roebuck, and Brush. Oh, my conscience! The fawning creature loves you! Hey, the constant effects of debauchery a woman are that she infallibly loves the man for doing the business, and he certainly hates her. But what company is she like to have with this same widow's brush? Oh, the best of company, sir. A poet lives there, sir. They are the worst company, for they're ill-natured. Aye, sir, but it does nobody any harm, for these fellows that get bred by their wits are always forced to eat their words. They must be good-natured spite of their teeth, sir. Tis said, he pays his lodgings by cracking some smutty jests with his landlady overnight, for she's very well pleased with his natural parts. While Roebuck and Brush converse together, Lovewell seems to project something by himself. What other lodges are there? One newly entered, a young squire, just come from the university. A mere peripatetic, I warrant him. 
a very pretty family a heathen philosopher an english poet and an irish horror had the landlady but a highland piper to join with them she might set up for a collection of monsters anybody within slaps lovewell on the shoulder yes you are my friend all my thoughts were employed about you in short i have one request to make that you would renounce your loose wild courses and lead a sober life as i do that i will if you grant me a boon you shall have it be it what it will that you would relinquish your precise sober behavior and live like a gentleman as i do that i can't grant then we're off though should your women prove no better than your wine my debaucheries will foreshorter themselves for want of temptation our women are worse than our wine our claret has but a little of the french in it but our wenches have the devil and all they are both adulterated to prevent the inconveniences of which i'll provide you an honourable mistress an honourable mistress what's that a virtuous lady whom you must love and court the surest method of reclaiming you as thus those superfluous pieces you throw away in wine may be laid out to the poor no no in sweet powder cravats garters snuff-boxes ribbons coach hire and chair hire those idle hours which you misspend with lewd sophisticated wenches must be dedicated to the church no to the innocent and charming conversation of your virtuous mistress by which means the two most exorbitant debaucheries drinking and whoring will be retrenched oh, a very fine retrenchment truly i must first despise the honest jolly conversation at the tavern for the foppish affected dull insipid entertainment at the chocolate house must quit my freedom with ingenious company to harness myself to foppery among the fluttering crowd at cooper's livery boys the second article is that i must resign the company of lewd women for that of my innocent mistress that is i must change my easy natural sin of wenching to that constrained debauchery of lying and swearing the many lies and oaths that i made to thy sister will go nearer to damn me than if i had enjoyed her a hundred times over oh roebuck your reason will maintain the contrary when you're in love that is when i have lost my reason come come a wench a wench a soft white easy consenting creature prithee ned leave mustiness and show me the varieties of the town a wench is the least variety look out see what a numerous train trip along the street there pointing outwards oh venus oh these fine stately creatures very well ned runs out Lovell catches him and pulls him back. Prithee, let me go. Tis a deed of charity. I am quite starved. I'll just take a snap and be with you in a twinkling. As you're my friend, I must go. Then we must break for ever. Quits him. He that will leave his friend for a whore, I reckon a commoner in friendship as in love. If you saw how ill that serious feast becomes a fellow of your years, you would never wear it again. Youth is taking in any masquerade but gravity. Though lewdness suits much worse with your circumstances, sir. Roebuck, aside. Ay, these circumstances. Damned these circumstances. Dare he has hamstring me. This poverty. How it makes a man sneak. Aloud. Well, prithee, let's know this devilish virtuous lady. By the circumstances of my body, I shall soon be off or on with her. Know then, for thy utter condemnation, that she's a lady of eighteen, beautiful, witty, and nicely virtuous. A lady of eighteen? Good, beautiful, better, witty, best of all. No, with these three qualifications, if she be nicely virtuous, then I'll henceforth adore everything that wears a petticoat. Witty and virtuous. <laughs> why it is as inconsistent in ladies as gentlemen and were i to debauch one for a wager her wit would be my board 
Come, come, the forbidden fruit was plucked from the tree of knowledge, boy. Right. But there was a cunninger devil than you to tempt. I'll assure you, George, your rhetoric would fail you here. She would worst you at your own weapons. Aye, or any man in England, if she be eighteen, as you say. Have a care, man. This satire will get you torn in pieces by the females. You'll fall into Orpheus's fate. Orpheus was a blockhead, and deserved his fate. Why? Because he went to hell for a wife. Lovewell, aside. This happens right. Aloud. But you shall go to heaven for a mistress. You shall court this divine creature. I don't desire you to fall in love with her. I don't intend you should marry her neither. But you must be convinced of the chastity of the sex. Though if you should conquer her, the spoil, you rogue, will be glorious, and infinitely worth the pains in attaining. Ay, but, Ned, my circumstances, my circumstances. Come, you shan't want money. Then I dare attempt it. Money is the sinews of love as of war. Gad, friend, doubt the bravest pimp I ever heard of. Well, give me directions to sail by, the name of my port. Lead me, Pockets, and end for the keep of good hope. You need no directions as to the manner of courtship. No. I have seen some few principles on which my courtship's founded, which seldom fail. To let a lady rely on my modesty, but to depend myself altogether upon my impudence. To use a mistress like a deity in public, but like a woman in private. To be as cautious then of asking an impertinent question as afterwards of telling a story, remembering that the tongue is the only member that can hurt a lady's honour, though touched in the tenderest part. Oh, but to a friend, George, you'll tell a friend your success? No, not to her very self. It must be as private as devotion. No blubbing, unless a squaring brat peeps out to tell tales. But where lies my course? Brush shall show you the house. The lady's name is Lucinda. Her mother and father dead, she's heiress to twelve hundred a year. But above all, observe this. She has a page which you must get on your side. Tis a very pretty boy. I presented him to the lady about a fortnight ago. He's your countryman, too. He brought me a letter from my sister, which I have about me. Here, you may read it. Roebuck, aside. Ay, tis her hand. I know it well, and I almost blush to see it. Reads. Dear brother, a lady of my acquaintance, lately dying, begged me, as her last request, to provide for this boy who was her page. I hope I have obeyed my friend's last command, and obliged a brother by sending him to you. Pray dispose of him as much as you can for his advantage. All friends are well, and I am your affectionate sister, Leanthe. While he reads, Lovell converses in dumb show with Brush. All friends are well. Is that all? Not a word of poor Roebuck? I wonder she mentioned nothing of my misfortunes to her brother. But she has forgot me already. True woman still. Well... I may excuse her, for I am making all the haste I can to forget her. Lovewell, aside to brush. Be sure you have an eye upon him, and come to me presently at Widow Bullfinch's. Well, George, you won't communicate your success? You may guess what you please. I'm as merry after a mistress as after a bottle. All air, brimful of joy, like a bumper of claret, smiling and sparkling. Then you'll certainly run over. No, no, nor shall I drink to anybody. Exeunt severally. Scene two, a room in Widow Bullfinch's house. A flute and music book upon the table. A case of toys hanging up. Enter Rigadoon, leading in mock mode by both hands. He sings and mock mode dances awkwardly. Club follows. Cow dow de row one two cow dow de row coupe cow dow de row very well 
Tow, tow, de row, wrong. Tow, tow, de row, toes out. Tow, tow, de row, observe time. Very well, sir. You shall dance as well as any man in England. You have an excellent disposition in your limbs, sir. Observe me, sir. Dance is a new minuet. At every cut, Club makes an awkward imitation by leaping up. And so forth, sir. I'm afraid we shall disturb my landlady. Landlady? Oh, you must have a care of that. She'll never pardon you, landlady. Every woman from a countess to a kitchen wench is madame, and every man from a lord to a lackey, sir. Must I then lose my title of squire? Squire Mockmode? By all means, sir. Squire and Phil were the same thing here. <laughs> That's very comical, Faith. But is there an act of parliament for that, Mr. Rigadoon? Well, since I can't be a squire, I'll do as well. I have a great estate, and want only to be a great beau to qualify me either for a knight or a lord. <sighs> By the universe, I have a great mind to bind myself prentice to a bow. Could I but dance well, push well, play upon the flute, and swear the most modish oaths, I would set up for quality with every young nobleman of them all. Pray, what are the most fashionable oaths in town? Zunes, I take it, is a very becoming one. Zunes is only used by disbanded officers and bullies, but Zounds is the bow pronunciation. Zounds? Zounds. Yes, sir, we swear as we dance, smooth and with a cadence. Zounds. Tis harmonious and pleases the ladies because tis soft. Zounds, madame, is the only compliment our great beau pass on a lady. But suppose the lady speaks to me, what must I say? Nothing, sir, you must take snush. Grin, and make her an humble cringe, thus. Bows foppishly, and takes snush. Mockmode imitates him awkwardly, and taking snush, sneezes. Oh, Lord, sir, you must never sneeze. Tis as unbecoming after orangerie as grace after meat. I thought people took it to clear the brain. The bow have no brains at all, sir. Their skull is a perfect snush box, and I heard a physician swear, who opened one of them, that the three divisions of his head were filled with orangery, bergamot, and plain Spanish. Sounds! I must sneeze! Oh! Oh, bless me! Oh, fie, Mr. Mockmode! What a rustic of expression that is! Bless me! You should upon all occasions cry, damn me! You would be as nauseous to the ladies as one of the old patriarchs, if you used that obsolete expression. Club aside. I find that going to the devil is very modish in this town. Aloud. Pray, Master Dancing Master, what religion may these bows be of? A sort of Indians in their religion. They worship the first thing they see in the morning. What's that, sir? Their own shadows in the glass, and some of them such hellish faces as might frighten them into devotion. Then they are Indians, right, for they worship the devil. Then you shall be as great a bow as any of them, but you must be sure to mind your dancing. Is uh, not music very convenient, too? I can play the bells and maiden fair already. Alamir, Bifabemi, Gesulfa, Delasol, Ela, Efo, Gesurut. I have them all by heart already. But I have been plaguily puzzled about the etymology of these notes, and certainly a man cannot arrive at any perfection unless he understands the derivation of the terms. Oh, Lord, sir, that's easy. Effalz and Gesulreuth were two famous German musicians, and the rest were Italians. But why are they only seven? From a prodigious great bass viol with seven strings, 
that played a jig called the music of the spheres. The seven planets were nothing but fiddle strings. Then your stars have made you a dancing master. Oh, Lord, sir. Pythagoras was a dancing master. He showed the creation to be a country dance, where after some antic changes all the parts fell into their places, and there they stand ready till the next squeak of a philosopher's fiddle sets them dancing again. Sir, here comes the pushing master. Then I'll be gone. But you must have a care of pushing, sir. We'll spoil the niceness of your steps. Learn a flourish or two, and that's all a bow can have occasion for. Exit. Enter Nimblewrist. Oh, Mr. Nimblewrist, I crave you ten thousand pardons by the universe. That was a home thrust. Good sir, I hope you're for a breathing this morning. Takes down a foil. I'll assure you, Mr. Mockmode, you will make an excellent swordsman. You're as well shaped for fencing as any man in Europe. The Duke of Burgundy is just of your make. He pushes the finest of any man in France. Sa, sa, like lightning. I'm much in love with fencing, but I think backsword is the best play. Oh, lard, sir. Have you ever been in France, sir? No, sir. But I understand the geography of it. France is bounded on the north with the Rhine. No, sir. A Frenchman is bounded on the north with court, on the south with tierce, and so forth. Tis a noble art, sir, and every one that wears a sword is obliged by his tenure to learn. The rules of honor are engraved on my hilt, and my blade must maintain em. My sword's my herald, and the bloody hand my coat of arms. And how long have you professed this noble art, sir? Truly, sir, I served an apprenticeship to this trade, sir. What? Are you a corporation, then? Yes, sir, the surgeons have taken us into theirs, because we make so much work for em. But as I was telling you, sir, I professed the science till the wars broke out. But then, when everybody got commissions, I put in for one served the campaigns in Flanders, and when the peace broke out, was disbanded. So among a great many other poor rogues am forced to be take to my old trade. Now the public quarrel's ended. I live by private ones. I still live by dying, as the song goes, sir. While we have English courages, French honor, and Spanish blades among us, I shall live, sir. Surely your sword and skill to the king great service abroad. Yes, sir, I killed above fifteen of our own officers by private duels in the camp, sir. Killed em fairly, killed em thus, sir. Sa, 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 parry, parry, parry. Pushes Mockmode on the ribs. He strikes nimble wrist over the head and breaks the foil. What's the name of that thrust, pray, sir? Oh, lard, sir, he did not touch me, not in the least, sir. The foil was cracked, a palpable crack. Blood runs down his face. A very palpable crack, truly. Your skull is only cracked, palpably cracked, that's all. Well, sir, if you please to teach me my honours, my dancing master has forbidden me any more, lest I should discompose my steps. Your dancing master is a blockhead, sir. Re-enter Rigadoon. I forgot my gloves, and so... Oh, sir, he calls you blockhead by the universe. Zounds, sir. Zounds, sir. I have more wit in the sole of my foot than you have in your whole body. Aye, sir, you capers dance all your brains into your heels, which makes you carry such empty noddles. Your rationals reversed, carrying your understanding in your legs. Your wit is the perfect antipodes to other men's. And what are you, good monsieur? Sa, sa! Stand upon your guard, Mr. Mockmode. He's the greatest falsifier in his art. You'll fill your head so full of French principles of honour that you won't have one of honesty left. His breastplate there he calls the butt of honour, at which all the fools in the kingdom shoot, 
and not one can hit the target you talk of robin hood who never shot in his bow sir you dancers are the battle doors of the nation that toss the light foppish shuttlecocks to and again to get yourselves in heat have a care mr mockmode this fellow will make a mere grasshopper of you sir you're the grand pimp to foppery and lewdness and the devil and dancing master dance a caranto over the whole kingdom a pimp sir what then sir i engage couples into the bed of love but you match them in the bed of honour we only juggle people out of their chastity but you cheat them out of their lives oh we shall have you mr mockmo grinning in the bed of honour as if you laughed at the fool who must be hanged for you which is best mr nimblewrist an easy minuet or a tyburn jig don't provoke my sword sir lest that art you so revile should revenge itself for every one of you that live by dancing should die by pushing sir and every man that lives by pushing shall die dancing i thank it zoon sir what do you mean nothing sir tal tal de rao dances this takes the ladies mr mockmo this runs away with all the great fortunes in town though you be a fool a fop a coward dance well and you captivate the ladies the moving a man's limbs pliantly does the business if you want a fortune come to me tal dal de rao dances no no to me sir sa sa does your business soonest with a woman a clean and manly extension of all your parts ha carrying a true point is the matter sa 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 defend yourself pushes at rigadoon who dances and sings, retiring off the stage. Enter Widow Bullfinch. Oh, goodness! What a room's here! Could not these fellows wipe their feet before they came up? And here's such a tripping and such a stomping that they have broke down all the ceiling. You dancing and fancy masters have been the downfall of many houses. Get out of my doors! my house was never in such a pickle you country gentlemen newly come to london like your own spaniels out of a pond must be shaking the water off and bespatter everybody about you mockmode having taken snush offering to sneeze sneezes in her face so's madam <laughs> oh bless me Damn me i mean widow bullfinch aside he's tainted these cursed flies have blown upon him already sa sa defend flanconard madam ah mr mockmode my pushing and dancing days are done but i had a son mr mockmode that would match you ah my poor robin he died of an apoplexy he was as pretty a young man as ever stepped in a black leather shoe he was as like you mr mockmode as one egg is like another he died like an angel but i'm sure he might have recovered but for the physicians oh these doctors these doctors blessed doctors i say for i believe they killed my honest old father ay that is true if my robin had left me in a state i should have said so too <laughs> zounds madam you must not be melancholy madam well sir i hope you'll give us the beverage of your fine clothes i'll assure you sir they fit you very well and i like your fancy mightily ay ay madam but what's most modish for beverage for i suppose the fashion of that alters always for the clothes the tailors are the best judges of that but champagne i suppose is champagne a tailor mm, now methinks that were a fitter name for a wig-maker 
I think they call my wig a campaign. You're clear out, sir, clear out. Champagne is a fine liquor, which all your great beau drink to make him witty. Witty? Oh, by the universe, I must be witty. I'll drink nothing else. I never was witty in all my life. I love jokes dearly. Here, club, bring us a bottle of what you call it, uh, the witty liquor. Exit club. But I thought all you that were bred at university should be wits naturally. The quite contrary, madam. There's no such thing there. We dare not have wit there for fear of being counted rakes. Your solid philosophy is all read there, which is clear another thing. But now I will be a wit by the universe. I must get acquainted with the great poets. Landlady, you must introduce me. Oh, dear me, sir. Would you ruin me? I introduce you? No widow dare be seen with a poet for fear she should be thought to keep him. Keep him? Uh, what's that? They keep nothing but sheep in the country. I hope they don't fleece the wits. Alas, sir, they have no fleeces. There's a great cry, but little wool. However, if you would be acquainted with the poets, I can prevail with a gentleman of my acquaintance to introduce you. Tis one Lovewell, a fine gentleman that comes here sometimes. Lovewell? By the universe, my rival. I heard of him in the country. Well, this puts me in mind of my mistress. Zounds, I'm certainly become a beau already, for I was so in love with myself I quite forgot her. I have a note in my pocketbook to find her out by. Pulls out a large pocketbook, turning over the leaves, reads to himself. Sixpence for washing, tuppence to the maid, sixpence for snush, one shilling for buttered ale. By the universe, I have lost the directions. Hark ye, madam, does the same Lovewell come often here, say you? Yes, sir, very often. There's a lady of his acquaintance, a lodger in the house just now. A lady of his acquaintance? A lodger in the house just now? Of his acquaintance, do you say? Yes, and a pretty lady too. And it comes often here, you say? Oh, by the universe, should I happen to lodge in the same house with my mistress? Egad, it must be the same. Can you tell the woman's name? Stay, is her name Lucinda? Perhaps it may, sir. But I believe she's a widow, for she has a young son, and I'm sure it is legitimately begotten, for it is the bravest child you shall see in a summer's day. Tis not like one of our puling brats or the town here, born with the diseases of half a dozen fathers about it. By the universe, I don't remember whether my mistress is maid or widow. But a widow, so much the better, for all your London widows are devilish rich, they say. She came in a coach, did she not, madam? Yes, sir, yes. Then tis infallibly she. Does she not always go out in a coach? She has not stirred abroad since she came, sir. Oh, uh, I was told she was very reserved, though tis very much of a widow. I have often heard my mother say that sitting at home and silence were very becoming in a maid, and she has often chid my sister Dorothy for gadding out to the meadows and tumbling among the cocks with the haymakers. Egad, I am the most lucky son of a whore. I was wrapped in the tale of my mother's smock, landlady. Enter servant. Oh, but this lady, sir. Madam, here's a gentleman below who wants to speak with you instantly. With me, child? Sir, I'll wait on you in a minute. Exit with servant. Re-enter club with wine and glasses. Is that the witty liquor? Oh, come, fill the glasses. Now that I have found my mistress, I must next find my wits. So you have need, master, for those that find a mistress are generally out of their wits. Gives him a glass. Come, fill for yourself. They jingle and drink. But where's the wit now, club? Have you found it? Egad, master, I think tis a very good jest. What? What? Why, drinking. 
you'll find master that this same gentleman in the straw doublet this same will o the wisp is a wit at the bottom fills here here master how it puns and quibbles in the glass by the universe now i have it the wit lies in the jingling all wit consists most in jingling hear how the glasses rhyme to one another what master are these wits so apt to clash jingle the glasses oh by the universe by the universe this is wit breaks them my landlady is in the right i have often heard there was wit in breaking glasses it would be a very good joke to break the flask now i find then that this same wit is very brittle ware but i think sir twere no joke to spill the wine ay ah, there suggests sarah all wit consists in losing there was never anything got by it i fancy the same wine is all sold at will's coffee-house do you know the way thither sirrah i long to see mr comic and mr tagrime with the rest of them i wonder how they look certainly these poets must have something extraordinary in their faces of all the rarities of the town i long to see nothing more than the poets in bedlam come in club i must go practice my honours Tol do de roll exit dancing and club toping Scene three. Another room in the same. Enter Lovewell and Widow Bullfinch. Oh, Mr. Lovewell, you come just in the nick. I was ready to spoil all by telling him that she was a stranger and just now come. Well, my dear madam, be cautious for the future. Tis the most fortunate chance that ever befell me. T'were convenient we had the other lodgers of our side. There's nobody but Mr. Lyric. And you had to safely tell a secret over a groaning cheese as to him. How so? Why, you must know that he has been lying in these four months of a play. And he has got all the muses about him. A parcel of the most tattling gossips. Come, come, no more words. But to our business, I will certainly reward you. But have you any good hopes of its succeeding? Very well, of the squire's side. But I'm afraid your widow will never play her part. She's so awkward and so sullen. Go you and instruct her while I manage affairs abroad. She's always raving of one Roebuck. Prithee, who is this same Roebuck? Ah, Mr. Lovewell, I'm afraid this widow of yours is something else at the bottom. I'm afraid there has been a dog in the well. Exit. Enter brush. So, sirrah, where have you left the gentleman? In a friend's house, sir. What friend? Why, a tavern. What took him there? A coach, sir. How do you mean? A coach and six, sir. No less, I'll assure you, sir. A coach and six? Yes, sir. Six whores and a carted board. He picked them all up in the street and is gone with this splendid retinue into the sun by Covent Garden. I asked him what he meant. He told me that he only wanted to wet, when the very sight of him turned my stomach. The fellow will have his swing, though he hang for it. However, run to him, and bid him take the name of Mockmode, call himself Mockmode upon all occasions, and tell him that he shall find me here about four in the afternoon. Ask no questions, but fly. Exit Brush. So... His usurping that name gives him a title to court Lucinda, by which I shall discover her inclinations to this mock mode, whose coming to town has certainly occasioned her quarrel with me. While I set the hound himself upon a wrong scent, and ten to one provide for Mistress Trudge by the bargain. Tis said one can't be a friend and a lover. But opposite to that, this plot shall prove, I'll serve my friend by what assists my love. Exit. End of Act Two. Act Three of Love in a Bottle by George Farquhar. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Three, Scene One A Room in Lucinda's House. Enter Leanthe. Methinks this livery suits ill my birth, but slave to love I must not disobey. 
his service is the hardest vassalage forcing the powers divine to lay their godships down to be more gods more happy here below thus i poor wanderer have left my country disguised myself so much i hardly know whether this habit or my love be blindest to follow one perhaps that loves me not though every breath of his soft words was passion and every accent love o oh, roebuck <laughs> enter roebuck this is the page love's link boy that must like me the way oh no pretty boy has your lady beaten you ha huh. this lady must be a venus for she has got a cupid in her family tis a wondrous pretty boy leanthe starts and stares at him but a very comical boy what the devil did she stare at leanthe aside oh heavens is the object real or are my eyes false is that roebuck or am i leanthe i am afraid he is not the same and too sure i am not myself <sighs> what offence could such pretty innocence commit to deserve a punishment to make you cry oh sir a wondrous offence what is it my child i pricked my finger with a pin till i made it bleed such little boys as you should have a care of sharp things indeed sir we ought for it pricked me so deep that the sore went to my very heart poor boy here's a plaster for your sore finger gives leanthe gold sir you had best kept it for a sore finger returns it oh my conscience the boy's witty but not very wise in returning gold come come you shall take it forces it upon her and kisses her that's the fitter cure for my sore finger <sighs> the same dear lips still oh that the tongue within them were as true by heavens this boy has the softest pair of lips i ever tasted i ne'er found before the ladies kissed their pages but now if this rogue were not too young i should suspect you beforehand with me hey god i must kiss him again come you shall take the money kisses oh how he bribes me into bribery but what must i do with this money sir you must get a little mistress and treat her with it sir i have one mistress already and they say no man can serve two masters much less two mistresses how many mistresses have you pray um egad the boy has posed me how many child why let me see there was mrs mary mrs margaret mrs lucy mrs susan mrs judy and so forth to the number of five and twenty or thereabouts oh ye powers and did you love them all yes desperately i would have drunk and fought for any one of them i have sworn and lied to every one of them and have lain with them all that's for your encouragement boy learn betimes youth young plants should be watered your smock face was made for a chamber utensil and did not one escape you yes one did to devil take her what don't you love her then no faith but he bear her an amorous grudge still something between love and spite he could kill her with kindness i don't believe it sir you could not be so hard-hearted sure her honourable passion i think should please you best oh child boys of your age are continually reading romances filling your heads with that old bombast of love and honour but when you come to my years you'll understand better things and must i be a false treacherous villain when i come to your years sir is falsehood and perjury essential to the perfect state of manhood pshaw <laughs> children and old men always talk thus foolishly you understand nothing boy 
yes sir i've been in love and much more than you i perceive it appears then that there's no service in the world so educating to a boy as a lady's by joe this spark may be older than i imagine hark ye sir do you never pull off your lady's shoes and stockings do you never reach for the pincushion do you never sit on her bedside and sing to her ha ah, come tell me that's my good boy makes much of her yes i do sing her asleep sometimes but do you never waken her again no but i constantly wake myself my rest's always disturbed by visions of the devil who would imagine now that this young shiva could dream of a woman so soon but what songs does your lady delight in most passionate ones sir i'll sing you one of them if you'll stay with all my heart my little cherubim the rogue is fond of showing his parts come begin how blessed are lovers in disguise like gods they see as i do thee unseen by human eyes exposed to view i'm hid from you i'm altered yet the same the dark conceals me love reveals me love which lights me by its flame were you not false you me would know for though your eyes could not devise your heart had told you so your heart would beat with eager heat and me by sympathy would find true love might see one change like me false love is only blind oh my little angel in voice and shape kisses her i could wish myself a female for thy sake leanthe aside you're much better as you are for my sake or if thou wert a woman i would what would you marry me would you marry me marry you child no no i love you too well for that you should not have my hand but all my body at once what to our business is your lady at home my lady what business have you with my lady pray sir don't ask questions you know mr lovewell yes very well he's my great friend and one i would serve above all the world but his sister his sister ha huh? that gives me a twinge for my sin pray mr page was the auntie well when you left her no sir but wondrous melancholy by the departure of a dear friend of hers to another world oh that was the person mentioned in her letter whose departure occasioned your departure for england that was the occasion of my coming too sure sir oh it was a dear friend to me the loss makes me weep poor tender-hearted creature but i still find there was not a word of me pray good boy let your mistress know here's one to wait on her your business is from mr lovewell i suppose sir yes yes then i'll go exit i've thrown my cast and i'm fairly in for it but aren't i an impudent dog had i as much gold in my breeches as brass in my face i durst attempt a whole nunnery this lady is a reputed virtue of good fortune and quality i am a rakily rascal not worth the groat and without any farther ceremony i'm going to debauch her but hold she does not know that i'm this rakily rascal and i know that she's a woman one of eighteen too beautiful witty oh my conscience upon second thoughts i'm not so very impudent neither now as to my management i'll first try the whining addresses and see if she'll bleed in the soft vein enter lucinda 
Have you any business with me, sir? Thus looked a forbidden fruit, luscious and tempting. Tis ripe and will soon fall, if one will shake the tree. Have you any business with me, sir? Comes nearer. Yes, madam, the business of mankind, to adore you. My love, like my blood, circulates through my veins, and at every pulse of my heart animates me with a fresh passion. Wonder not, madam, at the power of your eyes, whose painted darts have struck on a young and tender heart, which they easily pierced, and which, unaccustomed to such wounds, finds to smart more painful. The Anthe peeping in. Oh, traitor! Just such words he spoke to me. Heyday! I was never so attacked in all my life. In love with me, sir. Did you ever see me before? Never, by Jove. Oh, ten thousand times, madam. Your lovely idea is always in my view, whether asleep or awake, eating or drinking, walking, sitting, or standing, alone or in company, my fancy wholly feeds upon your dear image, and every thought is you. Now have I told about fifteen lies in a breath. I suppose, sir, you are some conceited young scribbler, who has got the benefits of a first play in your pocket, and are now going a fortune hunting. But why a scribbler, madam? Are my clothes so coarse as if they were spun by those lazy spinsters, the muses? Does the party of my foretop show so thin, as if it resembled the two withered tops of Parnassus? Do you see anything peculiarly whimsical or ill-natured in my face? Is my countenance strained, as if my head were distorted by a strangury of thought? Is there anything proudly, slovenly, or affectedly careless in my dress? Do my hands look like paper moths? I think, madam, I have nothing poetical about me. Yes, sir. You have wit enough to talk like a fool, and are fool enough to talk like a wit. You call me poet, madam, and I know no better way of revenge than to convince you that I am won by my impudence. Offers to kiss her hand. Then make me a copy of verses upon that, sir. Hits him on the ear and exit. Re-enter Leanthe. How do you like the subject, sir? Tis a very copious one. Spitting. It has made my jaws rhyme in my head. This it is to be taught a poet. Every mince must be casting his profession in his teeth. What? Gone? Aye. She knows that making verses requires solitude and retirement. She certainly was afraid I intended to beg leave to dedicate something. If ever I make love like a poetical fool again, may I never receive any fever but a subject for a copy of verses. Re-enter Lucinda. I won't dismiss him thus, for fear he lampoon me. Well, sir, have you done them? Yes, madam. Will you please to read? Catches her and kisses her three or four times. Oh, heaven, I can never bear it. I must devise some means to part them. Exit. Sir, your verses are too rough and constrained. However, because I gave the occasion, I'll pardon what's past. By the Lord, she was angry only because I did not make the first offer to her lips. Then, madam, the peace is concluded. Yes, and therefore both parties should draw out of the field. Going. Not till we make reprisals. I make peace with sword in hand, madam, until you return my heart, which you have taken, or your own in exchange, I will not put up. And so, madam, I proclaim open war again. Catches her. Re-enter Leanthe. Oh, madam, yonder's poor little crab, your lapdog has got his head between two of the window bars, and is like to be strangled. The dog howls behind the scenes. Oh, Lord! My poor Crabby! I must run to the rescue of my poor dog. I'll wait on you instantly. Come, come, Paige. Poor Crabby! Exit with Leanthe. Oh, the devil choke Crabby! Will I find there's much more rhetoric in the lips than in the tongue? Had Bush been the first word of my courtship, I might have gained the outworks by this. 
Impurance in love is like courage in war. Though both blind chances, because women and fortune rule them. Re-enter Leanthe. Sir, my lady begs your pardon. There's something extraordinary happened, which prevents her waiting on you as she promised. What? Has Monsieur Crabby rubbed some of the hairs off his neck? Has he disordered his pretty ears? She won't come again, then? No, sir. You must excuse her. Then now go be drunk. Hacky, sirrah, where you have half a dozen delicious creatures waiting for me at the sun. You shall along with me and have your choice. I'll enter you in the school of Venus, child. Tis time you had lost your maidenhead. You're too old for playthings. Oh, heavens! I had rather he should stay than go there. But why will you keep such company, sir? Nay, if you've heard advice, farewell. Men of ripe understanding should always despise what babes only practice and dotards advise. Exit singing. Wild as winds and unconfined as air, yet I may reclaim him. His follies are weakly founded upon the principles of honour, where the very foundation helps to undermine the structure. How charming would virtue look in him, whose behaviour can add a grace to the unseemliness of vice. Re-enter Lucinda. What? Is the gentleman gone? Yes, madam. He was instantly taken ill with a violent pain in his stomach, and was forced to hurry away in a chair to his lodging. Exit. Oh, poor gentleman! He's one of those conceited fools that think no female can resist their temptations. Blockheads that imagine all wit to consist in blaspheming heaven and women. I'll feed his vanity, but starve his love. And may all coxcombs meet no better fate, who doubt our sex's virtue, or dare prompt our hate. Exit. Scene 2. A room in Widow Bullfinch's house. Lyric, discovered in a nightgown and cap, writing at a table on which papers are scattered about. Two as good lines as ever were written. Rising. Egad, I shall maul these topping fellows. Says Mr. Lee, let there be not one glimpse, one starry spark, but gods meet gods and jostle in the dark. Says little Lyric, let all the lights be burst out to a snuff, and gods meet gods and play at blind men's bluff. Very well. Let gods meet gods and so fall out and cuff. That's much mended. They're as noble lines as ever were penned. Oh, here comes my damned muse. I'm always in the humor of writing elegy after a little of her inspiration. Enter Widow Bullfinch. Mr. Lyric, what do you mean by all this? Here you have lodged two years in my house, promised me eighteen pence a week for your lodging, and I have never received eighteen farthings. Not the value of that, Mr. Lyric. Snaps with her fingers. You always put me off with telling me of your play. Your play. Sir, you shall play no more with me. I'm in earnest. This living on love is the dearest lodging. A man's eternally dunned. Though perhaps he have less of one ready coin than t'other. There's more trouble in a play than you imagine, madam. There's more trouble with a lodger than you think, Mr. Lyric. First, there's the decorum of time. Which you never observe, for you keep the worst hours of any lodger in town. Then there's the exactness of characters. And you have the most scandalous one I ever heard. Then there's the laying the drama. Then you foul my napkins and towels. Then there are preparations of incidents, working the passions, beauty of expressions, closeness of plot, justness of place, turn of language, opening the catastrophe. Then you wear out my sheets, 
burn my fire and candle, dirty my house, eat my meat, destroy my drink, wear out my furniture. I have lent you money out of my pocket. Was ever poor rogue so ridden? If ever the muses had a horse, I am he. Faith, madam, poor Pegasus is jaded. Come, come, sir. He shan't slip his neck out of the collar for all that. Money I will have, and money I must have. Let your play and you both be damned. Well, madam, my bookseller is to bring me some twenty guineas for a few sheets of mine presently, which I hope will free me from your sheets. My sheets, Mr. Lyric? Pray, what do you mean? I'll assure you, sir. My sheets are finer than any of your muses spinning. Mary, come up. Faith, you have spun me so fine that you have almost cracked my thread of life, as may appear by my spindle shanks. Why, sure. Where was your Talia and your Melpomene when the tailor would have stripped you of your silk waistcoat and have clopped you on a stone doublet? Would all your golden verse have paid the sergeant's fees? Truly, you freed me from jail to confine me in a dungeon. You did not ransom me, but bought me as a slave. So, madam, I'll purchase my freedom as soon as possible. Flesh and blood can't bear it. Take your course, sir. There were a couple of gentlemen just now to inquire for you. And if they come again, they shan't be put off with the old story of your being abroad. I'll promise you that, sir. Exit. Zoons, if this bookseller does not bring me money. Enter Pamphlet. Oh, Mr. Pamphlet, your servant. Have you perused my poems? Yes, sir, and there are some things very well, extraordinary well, Mr. Lyric. But I don't think I'm for my purpose. Poetry is a mere drug, sir. Is that because I take physic when I write? Damn this costive fellow! Now does he not apprehend the joke? No, sir, but your name does not recommend them. One must write himself into a consumption before he gains reputation. That's the way to lie abed when his name's up. Now I lie abed before I can gain reputation. Why so, sir? Because I have scarcely any clothes to put on. If ever man did penance in a white sheet. You stand only sometimes in a white sheet for your offences with your landlady. Faith, I have often wondered how your muse could take such flights, yoked to such a cartload as she is. Oh, they are like the Irish horses. They draw best by the tail. Have you ever seen any of my burlesque, Mr. Pamphlet? I have a project of turning three or four of our most topping fellows into doggerel. As for example, Conquest with laurels has our arms adorned, and Rome in tears of blood our anger mourned. Now, butchers with rosemary have our beef adorned, which has in gravy tears our hunger mourned. How do you like it, Mr. Pamphlet, huh? Well, like gods we passed the rugged alpine hills, melted our way, and drove our hissing wheels through cloudy deluges, eternal rills. Now observe, Mr. Pamphlet, pray observe. Like razors keen, our knives cut passage clean, through rills of fat and deluges of lean. Very well, upon my soul. Hurled dreadful fire and vinegar infused. Ay, sir, vinegar. How patly that comes in for the beef, Mr. Lyric. Tis all wondrous fine indeed. This is the most ingenious fellow of his trade that I have seen. He understands a good thing. But as to our business, what are you willing to give for these poems? Prithee say something. There are about three thousand lines. Here. Take him for a couple of guineas. No, sir. Paper is so excessive dear that I dare not venture upon him. Well, because you're a friend, I'll bestow him upon you. Here, take em all. 
There's the hopes of a dedication still. I give you a thousand thanks, sir, but I dare not venture the hazard. They'll never quit cost indeed, sir. This fellow is one of the greatest blockheads that ever was a member of a corporation. How shall I be revenged? Enter boy. Sir, there are two men below, desire to have the honor of kissing your hand. They must be knaves or fools by their fulsome compliment. Hark ye. Whispers boy. Bid him walk up. Since you have got company, sir, I'll take my leave. No, no, Mr. Pamphlet, by no means. We must drink before we part. Boy, a pint of sack and a toast. Exit, boy. These are two gentlemen out of the country, who will be for all the new things lately published. They'll be good customers. Come sit down. You have not seen my play yet? Here, take the pen, and if you see anything amiss, correct it. I'll go bring em up. Stay. Lend me your hat and wig, or I shall take cold going downstairs. Takes Pamphlet's hat and wig, and puts his cap on Pamphlet's head, and exit. This is a right poetical cap. Tis bays the outside and the lining fustian. Reading. Mm, this is all stuff worse than his poems. Enter two bailiffs behind and clap him on the shoulder. Sir, you're the king's prisoner. That's a good fancy enough, Mr. Lyric, but pray don't interrupt me, I'm in the best scene. You get the drama is very well laid. Come, sir. Well, well, sir, I'll pledge ye. Prithee now, good Mr. Lyric, don't disturb me. And furious lightnings brandished in her eyes. That's true spirit of poetry. Zulin, sir, do you banter us? Takes him under each arm and hauls him up. Gentlemen, I beg your pardon. How do you like the city, gentlemen? If you have any occasion for books to carry into the country, I can furnish you as well as many men about Paul's. Where's Mr. Lyric? These wits are damnable cunning. I always have double fees for arresting one of you wits. All your evasions won't do. We understand traps, sir. You must not think to catch old birds with shafts, sir. Zoons, gentlemen, I'm not the person. I'm a freeman of the city. I have good effects, gentlemen, good effects. Do you think to make a fool of me? I'm a bookseller, no poet. Aye, uh, sir, we know what you are by your fool's cap there. Yes, one of you wits would have passed upon us for a corn-cutter yesterday, and was so like one we had almost believed him. Hauls him. Why, gentlemen, gentlemen, officers, have a little patience and Mr. Lyric will come upstairs. No, no, Mr. Lyric shall go downstairs. He would have us wait till some friends come in to rescue him. Ah, these wits are devilish cunning. Exeunt bailiffs, hauling pamphlet. Re-enter Lyric with mock mode and club. Ha, ha, ha! Very poetical faith. A good plot for a play, Mr. Mock mode. A bookseller bound in calves' leather. Ha, ha, ha! How they walked along like the three volumes of the English rogue, squeezed together on a shelf. What was it? What was it, Mr. Lyric? Why, I am a statesman, sir. I can't but laugh to think how they'll sponge the sheet before the errata be blotted out. Then how will he hamper the dogs for false imprisonment? But pray, what's the matter, Mr. Lyric? Nothing, sir, but a shirking bookseller that owed me about forty guineas for a few lines. He would have put me off, so I sent for a couple of bulldogs and arrested him. Oh, Lord! Mr. Lyric, honesty is quite out of doors. Tis a rare thing to find a man that's a true friend. A true friend is a rare thing indeed. Mr. Lyric, will you be my friend? I only want that accomplishment. I have got a mistress, a dancing and fencing master, and now I want only a friend to be a fine gentleman. Have you never had a friend, sir? Yes, a very honest fellow. Our friendship commenced in the college cellar and we loved one another like two brothers. 
still we unluckily fell out afterwards at a game at tables i find then that neither of ye lost by the set but my short acquaintance can't recommend me to such a trust pshaw acquaintance you must be a man of honour as you're a poet sir but what use would you make of a friend sir only to tell my secrets to and be my second now sir a wit must be best to keep a secret because what you say to one's prejudice will be thought malice then you must have a devilish deal of courage by your heroic writing but know that i alone am king of me heavens sure the author of that line must be a plaguy stout fellow it makes me valiant as hector when i read it sir we stick to what we write as little as divines to what they preach besides sir there are other qualifications requisite in a friend he must lend you money now sir i can't be that friend for i want forty guineas sir i can lend you fifty upon good security twas the last word my father spoke on his deathbed that i should never lend money without security fie sir security from a friend and a man of honour by his profession too by the universe that's true you are my friend then i'll tell you a secret they whisper now will this plaguy wit turn my nose out of joint i was my master's friend before though i never found the knack of borrowing money though i have received some marks of his friendship some sound drubs about the head and shoulders or so i have been bound to him too in the stocks for his breaking windows very often mr mockmode you may be imposed upon i would see this lady you court i know mr lovewell has a mistress named lucinda but that she lodges in this house i much doubt imposed upon well that's very comical <laughs> you shall see sir come pray sir you're my friend nay pray indeed sir i beg your they compliment for the door pardon you're a squire sir zounds sir you lie i'm not a fool i'll take an affront from no man draw sir draws draw sir egad i'll put his nose out of joint now unequal numbers gentlemen i'm only my master's friend his second or so sir what's the matter noble squire you lie again sir zounds draw strikes him with his sword ha a blow essex a blow yet i will be calm zounds draw sir strikes him o oh, patience heaven thou art my friend still you lie sir then thou art a traitor tyrant monster zounds sir you're a son of a whore and a rascal a scribbler ah ah that stings home scribbler ay scribbler ballad maker nay then i and the gods will fight it with ye all draws enter roebuck drunk and singing france will ne'er comply till her claret run dry then let's pull away to defeat her he hinders the peace who refuses his glass and deserves to be hanged for a traitor. <coughs> so, my myrmidons, fall on, I have taken off the odds. Dub a dub, dub a dub, to the battle. So, gentlemen, why don't ye fight? Blood, fight! Oblige me to fight a little. He longed to see a little sport. Sir, I scorn to show sport to any man. Puts up. And so do I by the universe. And I by the universe. I shall take another time. Exit. Here, rascal, take your chubby knife. Gives Club his sword. And bring me a joint of that coward's flesh for your master's supper. Fly, dog. Takes him by the nose. Ah! Uh! This fellow's likeliest to put my nose out of joint. Exit. Now, sir, tell me, how you durst be a coward? Coward, sir? 
I am a man of great estate, sir. I have five thousand acres of as good fighting ground as any in England. Good terra firma, sir. Coward, sir, have a care what you say, sir. My father was a Parliament man, sir, and I was bred at the college, sir. Oh, then I know your genealogy. Your father was a senior fellow, and your mother was an air pump. You were suckled by platonic ideas, and you have some of your mother's milk in your nose yet. Form the proposition by mode and figure, sir. I told you so. Blow your nose, child, and have a care of dirting your philosophical slabbering bib. What do you mean, sir? Your stanched band set by mode and figure, sir. Band, sir? This fellow's blind drunk. I wear a cravat, sir. Then set a good face upon the matter. Throw off childishness and folly with your hanging sleeves. Now you have left the university. Learn! Learn! This fellow's an atheist by the universe. I'll take notice of him and inform against him for being drunk. Pray, sir, what's your name? My name? By the Lord. I forgot. <laughs> Stay. I shall think on it by and by. Zounds, forget your own name. Your memory must be very short, sir. Ay, so it seems, for I was but christened this morning, and I forgot it already. Was your worship then Turk or Jew before? I knew he was some damned bloody dog. Sir, I have been Turk, or Jew, rather, since, for I have got a plaguy heathenish name. Pox on't! Oh, no, I have it. Mo mock, mock, mock mode. Mock mode? M mock mode? Uh, sir, pray, how do you spell it? Go you to your ABC. You came last from the university. Sir, I'm called Mockmode. What family are you of, sir? What family are you of, sir? Of Mockmode Hall in Shropshire. The name of the same, I believe. I fancy, sir, that you and I are near relations. The relations? Sir, there are about two families. My father's, who is now dead, and his brother's, Colonel Peaceable Mockmode. Ay, ay. The very same Colonel Peaceable. Is he not Colonel of Militia? Yes, sir. And was he not High Sheriff of the County last year? The very same, sir. The very same. I'm of that family. And your father died about, let me see. About half a year ago. Exactly. By the same token, you got drunk at a hunting match that very day, seven night, he was buried. This fellow's a witch. But it looks very strange that you should be christened this morning. I'm sure your godfather's had a plaguey deal to answer for. Oh, sir, I'm a need to answer for myself. One would not think so. You're so forgetful. Tis two and twenty years since I was christened, and I can remember my name still. Come, we'll take a glass of wine, and that will clear our understanding. We'll remember our friends. You must excuse me, sir. This is some sharper. Nay, prithee, cousin, good cousin Mochmode, one glass. I know you are an honest fellow. We must remember our relations in the country, indeed, sir. Oh, sir, you're so short of memory you can never call him to mind. You have forgot yourself, sir. Mochmode is a heathenish name, sir, and all that, sir. And so I beg your pardon, sir. Exit. Now, were I lawyer enough, by the little inquiry into that fellow's concerns, I could bring in a full steed to cheat him of his estate. Enter Brush. Where the devil is thy master? You said I should find him here. It is impossible for you, or me, or anybody to find him. Why? Because he has lost himself. The devil has made a juggler's ball of him, I believe. He's here now. Then, presto! Pass in an instant. He has got some damn business today in hand. Aye, so it seems. I must be square mock mode, and caught an honourable mistress in the devil's name. Well, let my sober thinking friend plot on, and lay traps to catch futurity. I aim for holding fast the present. I have got about twenty guineas in my pocket. 
and whilst they lust, the devil take George if he thinks of futurity. I'll go hand in hand with fortune. She is an honest, giddy, reeling punk. My head, her wheel, turn around, and so we both are drunk. Exit reeling, brush following. End of Act Three. Act Four of Love and a Bottle by George Farquhar. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Four, Scene One A Room in Lucinda's House. Enter Leanthe, Pendress following with a paper of sweetmeats in her hand. Hear, hear, Page. Your lady has sent you some sweetmeats. But indeed, you shan't have them till you hire me. She sends sour sauce when she made you the bearer. Prithee now, what makes you constantly so melancholy? Come, you must be merry, and shall be merry. I'll get you some playthings. I believe you want playthings more than I, but I would be private, Pindress. Well, my child, I'll be private with you. Boys and girls should still be private together, and we may be as retired as we please, for my mistress is reading in her closet, and all the servants are below. But what concerns have you? I'm sure such a little boy can have no great business in private. Nianthe aside. I will try thee for once. Aloud. Yes, Mistress Pindress, I have great inclination. To what? To do what, sir? Don't name it. Tis all in vain. You shan't do it. You need not ask it. Only to kiss you. Kisses her. Oh, fie, sir. Indeed, I'll none of your kisses. Take it back again. Kisses Leanthe. Is not the taste of the sweetmeats very pretty about my lips? Oh, hang you licorice chaps. You'd fain be licking your lips, I find that. Indeed, Mr. Page. I won't pay you the kisses you won for me last night at cross purposes, and you shan't think to keep my pawn neither. Pray, give me my hungry bottle. As I hope to be saved, I will have my hungry bottle. Rummaging Leanthe. I'm stronger than you. I'll carry you in and throw you upon the bed and take it from you. Takes Leanthe in her arms. Help! Help! I shall be ravished! Help! Help! Enter Lucinda. What's the matter? Oh, bless me! Oh, dear madam, this unlucky boy had almost spoiled me. Did not your ladyship hear me cry I should be ravished? I was so weak, I could not resist the little strong rogue. He whipped me up in his arms like a baby, and had not your ladyship come in. What, sirrah? Would you debauch my maid, you little cock-sparrow? Must you be billing, too? I have a great mind to make her whip you, sirrah. Oh, dear madam, let me do it. I'll take him into the room, and I will so chastise him. But do you think you'll be able, Pindress? I'll send one of the men to help you. No, no, madam. I could manage him with one hand. See here, madam. Takes Leanthe in her arms and is running away. Hold, hold! Is this you that the little strong rogue had almost ravished? He snatched you up in his arms like a baby. Oh, Pinterest, Pinterest! I see you are very weak indeed. Are you not ashamed, girl, to debauch my little boy? Your ladyship gave me orders to make him merry and divert his melancholy, and I know no better way than to tease him a little. I'm afraid the boy is troubled with the rickets, and a little shaky, madam, would do him some good. Leanthe aside. I am tired with impertinence, and have other business to mind. Exit. I hope your ladyship entertains no ill opinion of my virtue. Truly, I don't know what to think on't. But I've so good an opinion of your sense as to believe you would not play the fool with a child. We're all subject to playing the fool if you continue your resolution in marrying the first man that asks you the question. No, my mind's changed. I'll never marry any man. Pinterest aside. 
I dare swear that resolution breaks sooner than the former. Aloud. Ah, madam, madam, if you never believe man again, you must never be woman again. For though we are as cunning as serpents, we are naturally as flexible too. Speak ingenuously, madam. If Mr. Lovewell should with an amorous whine and suppliant cringe tell you a formal story contrary to what we suspect, would you not believe him? What? Believe his vain assertions before the demonstration of my senses? No, no. My love's not so blind. Did I not see his miss and his child? Did I not behold him giving her money? Did I not hear him declare he would settle her in a lodging? But, madam, upon serious reflection, where's the great harm in all this? Most ladies would be overjoyed at such a discovery at their lover's ability. The child seemed a lusty, chopping boy, and let me tell you, madam, it must be a lusty, chopping boy that got it. Urge no father in his defence. He's a villain, and of all villains that I hate most, an hypocritical one. The ladies give him the epithet of modest, and the gentleman that of sober Lovewell. Now, methinks, such a piece of debauchery sits so awkwardly on a person of his character that it adds an unseemliness to the natural vileness of the vice. And he that dares be a hypocrite in religion will certainly be one in love. Stay, is not that he? Pointing outwards. Yes, madam, I believe he's going to the park. Call a couple of chairs quickly. We'll thither, masked. Exit Pindress. This day's adventures argue some intended plot upon me, which I may countermine by only setting a face upon the matter. Puts her mask on. For as hypocrisy in men can move, here's the best hypocrite in female love. On even scores designing heaven took care, since men force hearts, that we false faces wear. Exit. Scene two, the park. Enter Lovewell and Lyric, meeting. Lyric reading. I'll rack thy reputation, blast thy fame, and in strong grinding satire give it up thy name. What, in a rapture, Mr. Lyric? A little poetical fury, that's all. I'll squire him. I'll draw his character for the buffoon of a farce. He shall be as famous in ballad as Robin Hood or Little John. My muses shall haunt him like demons. They shall make him more ridiculous than Don Quixote. Because he encountered your windmill, Pate. <laughs> come, come, Mr. Lyric. You must be pacified. Pacified, sir? Zounds, sir, he's a fool. Has not a grain of sense. Were he an ingenious fellow or a man of parts, I could bear a kicking from him. But an abuse from a blockhead, I can never suffer it. Reads. Pert blockhead who has purchased by the school just sense enough to make a noted fool. That stings, Mr. Lovewell. Pray, sir, let me see it. It is imperfect, sir, but if you please to give your judgment on this piece. Gives him a paper. Tis a piece of burlesque on some of our late writings. I, you poets mount first on the shoulders of your predecessors to see farther in making discoveries, and having once got the upper hand, you spurn them underfoot. I think you should bear a veneration to their very ashes. Aye, if most of their writings had been burned. I declare, Mr. Lovewell, their fame has only made them more remarkably faulty. Their great beauties only illustrate their greater errors. Well, you saw the new tragedy last night. How did it please ye? Very well. It made me laugh heartily. What? Laugh at a tragedy? I laugh to see the ladies cry, to see so many weep at the death of the fabulous hero. Who would but laugh if the poet that made him were hanged? On my conscience, these tragedies make the ladies vent all their love and honor at their eyes, when the same white handkerchief that blows their noses must be a winding sheet to the deceased hero. Then there's something in the handkerchief to embalm him, Mr. Lyric. <laughs> but what relish have you of comedy? No satisfactory one. My curiosity is forestalled by a foreknowledge of what shall happen. For as the hero in tragedy is either a whining, cringing fool that's always a stabbing himself, or a ranting, hectoring bully that's for killing everybody else. 
so the hero in comedy is always the poet's character what's that a compound of practical rake and speculative gentleman who always bears off the great fortune in the play and shams the beau and squire with a whore or chambermaid and as the catastrophe of all tragedies is death so the end of comedies is marriage and some think that the most tragical conclusion of the two and therefore my eyes are diverted by a better comedy in the audience than that upon the stage i have often wondered why men should be fond of seeing fools ill represented when at the same time and place they may behold the mighty originals acting their parts to the life in the boxes oh be favourable to the ladies mr lyric tis your interest beauty is the deity of poetry and if you rebel you'll certainly run the fate of your first parent the devil you're out sir beauty is a merciful deity and allows us sometimes to be a little atheistical and tis so indulgent to wit that it is pleased with it though in the worst habit that of satire besides there can appear no greater argument of our esteem than raillery because tis still founded upon jealousy occasioned by their preferring senseless fops and wealthy fools to men of wit and merit the great upholders of the empire now i think these favorites of the ladies are more witty than you how so pray sir because they play the fool conscious that it will please and you're a wit when sensible that coxcombs only are encouraged i wonder mr lyric that a man of your sense should turn poet you'll hardly ever find a man that is capable of the employment will undertake it the reason of that is every one that knows not a tittle of the matter pretends to be a judge of it by the lard mr lovewell i put the critics next to plague pestilence and famine in my litany had you seen him last night in the pit with such demure supercilious faces their contemplative wigs thrust judiciously backwards their hands rubbing their temples to chafe ill nature and with a hissing venomous tongue pronouncing pish stuff intolerable damn him lord have mercy upon us ay and you shall have others as foolish as they are ill-natured fond of being thought wits who shall laugh outrageously at every smutty jest cry very well by gad that's fine by heavens and if a distich of rhyme happens they clap so damnably loud that they drown the jest that's the jest the wit lies in their hands and if you would tell a poet his fortune you must gather it from the palmistry of the audience for as nothing's ill said but what's ill taken, so nothing's well said but what's well taken. And between you and I, Mr. Lovewell, poetry without these laughing fools were a bell without clapper, an empty sounding business good for nothing, and all we professors might go hang ourselves in the bell ropes. <laughs> but I thought poetry was instructive. Oh, God, forgive me, that's true to ladies it is morally beneficial for you must know they are too nice to read sermons such instructions are too gross for their refined apprehensions but any precepts that may be instilled by easy numbers such as of rochester and others make great converts then they hate to hear a fellow in church preach methodical nonsense with a firstly secondly and thirdly but they take up with some of our modern plays in their closet where the morality must be devilish instructive. But I must be gone. Here comes the squire. What in the name of wonder has he got with him? That which shall afford you a more plentiful revenge than your lampoon, if you join with me in the plot, to the better effecting of which you must be seemingly reconciled to him. Let's step aside and observe him while I give you a hint of the matter. Exit between the scenes and seem to confer and hearken. Enter Mockmode, leading Trudge, dressed like widow. This is very fine weather. Blessed weather indeed, madam. Twill do abundance of good to the grass and corn. Aye, sir. The days are grown a great length, and I think the weather much better here than in Ireland. Why, madam, were you ever there? Oh, no. Not I, indeed, sir. But I have heard my first husband rest his soul 
say so he was an irish gentleman i find madam you have loved your first husband mightily for you affect his tone in discourse pray madam what did that morning cost a yard trudge aside oh lord what shall i say now tis none of mine aloud it costs a uh, let me see it cost about but it was my steward bought it for me i never buy such small things mock mode aside by the universe she must be plaguy rich i will be brisk aloud pray madam i i pray madam will you give us a song a song indeed then i had a good voice before mr roebuck spoiled it mr roebuck was that your first husband's name madam lovewell behind she'll spoil all no sir roebuck was a doctor that let me blood under the tongue for the quinsy and made me horse ever since mock mode aside by the universe she's a widow and i'll be a little brisk aloud madam will you grant me a small favour and i will bend upon my knees to receive it kneels what is it pray only to take off your garter re-enter lovewell lovewell aside zones her thick leg will discover all aloud by your leave sir have you any pretensions to this lady pushes mock mode down mock mode aside i don't know whether this be an affront or not aloud pretensions sir i have so great a veneration for the lady that i honour any man that has pretensions to her damn me sir may i crave the honour of your acquaintance no sir mock mode aside no sir egad that must be wit for it can't be good manners aloud sir i respect all men of sense and would therefore beg to know your name no matter sir i know your name's mock mode <laughs> by the universe that's very comical that a fellow should pretend to tell me my own name another question if you please sir what is it sir pray sir what's my christened name sir you don't know zound sir would you persuade me out of my christened name i'll lay you a guinea that i do know by the universe pulls a handful of money out here's silver sir here's silver sir i can command as much money as another sir i'm at age sir and i won't be bantered sir sir you must know that i baptize you rival for your love to this lady is the only sign of christianity you can boast of and now sir my name's lovewell then i say sir that your love to that lady is the only sign of a turk you can brag of aside i wish club were come sir i shall certainly circumcise you if you make any further pretensions to madame lucinda here circumcise me circumcise a pudding then sir zounds sir i'll be judged by the lady who merits circumcision most you or i sir these london blades are all stock mad lovewell courts trudge in dumb show enter lucinda and pendress seeing the others they abscond i met one about two hours ago that had forgot his name this fellow would persuade me now that i had forgot mine mr lyric is the only man that speaks plain to me i must be friends with him because i find i may have occasion for such a friend i'll find him out straight exit madam will you walk exit with trudge lucinda coming forward now my doubts are removed mine are more puzzling there must be something in this more than we imagine you had best talk to him yes if my tongue bore poison in it and that i could spit death in his face if he is lost your hard usage this morning has occasioned it i'm glad aunt i've gained by the loss i despise him more than e'er i loved him that passion which can stoop so low as that blouse is an object too mean for anything but my scorn to level at 
This were a critical minute for your new lover the squire, I fancy. Mr. Lovell's disgrace would bring him into favour presently. It certainly shall, if he be not as great a fool as t'other's false. You may be mistaken in your opinion of him as much as you have been in Mr. Lovewell. No, Pindress, I shall find what I read in the last miscellanies very true. But two distinctions their whole sex does part, all fools by nature, or all rogues by art. Exeunt. Scene three, another part of the same. Enter several masks crossing the stage, Roebuck following. Death. What a conny burrows here. The trade goes swimmingly on. This is the great empery of lewdness, as the changes of knavery. The merchants cheat the world there, and their wives gull them here. I begin to think hurrying scandalous, tis grown so mechanical. My modesty will do me no good, I fear. Madam, are you a whore? Catches a mask. Yes, sir. Exit. Shot and pithy. If e'er a woman spoke truth, I believe thou hast. Second mask pulls him by the elbow. Have you any business with me, madam? Pray, sir, be civil. You're mistaken, sir. Aside. I have had an eye upon this fellow all this afternoon. Aloud. You're mistaken, sir. Very likely, madam, for I imagined you modest. So I am, for I am married. And married to your sorrow, I warrant you. Yes, upon my honour, sir. I knew it. I have met above a dozen this evening, all married to their sorrow. Then I suppose you're a citizen's wife, and by the broadness of your bottom, I should guess you sat very much behind a counter. My husband's no more, sir. He's a judge. Zones? A judge? I shall be arraigned at the bar for keeping on my hat so long. Tis very hard, madam, he should not do you justice. Has he not an estate in tail, madam? I seldom examine his papers. They are a parcel of old, dry, shriveled parchments, and his court hand is so devilish crabbed, I cannot endure it. Uh. Then I suppose, madam, you want a young lawyer to put your case to. But faith, madam, I am a judge too. Oh, heavens forbid! Such a young man! That's, I'll do nothing without a bribe. Pray, madam, how does that watch strike? It never strikes. It only points to the business, as you must do, without telling tales. Dare you meet me two hours hence? Aye, madam, but I shall never hit the time exactly without a watch. Well, take it. At ten exactly, at the fountain in the middle temple. Coke upon Littleton, be the word. Exit. So, if the law be all such volumes as thou, mercy on the poor students. From Coke upon Littleton in sheets, deliver me. Enter Lovewell. What, engaged? Myrmidon, I find you'll never quit the battle till you have cracked a pike in the service. Oh, dear friend, thou critically come to my relief. For faith, I'm almost tired. What a miserable creature is a whore, whom every fool dares pretend to love, and every wise man hates. What, moralizing again? Oh, I'll deadly newsman. I'm entered in the ends, by the Lord. Pshaw! Nay, if you won't believe me, see my note of admission. Shows the watch. A gold watch, boy. Aye, a gold watch, boy. When said you the money to buy it? I took it upon tick, and I designed to pay honestly. I don't like this running of the score. But what news from Lucinda, boy? Is she kind, huh? Enter a mask crossing the stage. Ha! Ah. There's a stately cruiser. I must give her one chase. I'll tell you when I return. Exit running. I find he has been at a loss there, which occasions his eagerness for the game here. I begin to repent me of my suspicion. I believe her virtue so sacred that tis a piece of atheism to distrust its existence. But jealousy in love, like the devil in religion, is still raising doubts. 
which without a firm faith in what we adore will certainly damn us. Enter a porter. Is your name Mr. Roebuck, sir? What would you have with Mr. Roebuck, sir? I have a small note for him, sir. Let me see it. Aye, sir, if your name be Mr. Roebuck, sir. My name is Roebuck, blockhead. God bless you, master. Gives him a letter and exit. This is some tawdry billet, with a scrawling adieu at the end on't. These strolling jades know a young wholesome fellow newly come to town as well as a parson's wife does a fat goose. Tis certainly some secret, and therefore shall be known. Opens the letter. Tuesday, three o'clock. Sir, my behavior towards you this morning was somewhat strange, but I shall tell you the cause of it if you meet me at ten this night in our garden. The back door shall be open. Yours, Lucinda. Oh, heavens! Certainly it can't be. L-U-C-I-N-D-A. That spells woman. T'was never written so plain before. Roebuck, thou art as true an oracle as she is a false one. Oh, thy damned Sibyl! I have courted thee these three years, and could never obtain above a kiss of the hand. And this fellow in an hour or two has obtained the back door open? Mr. Roebuck, since I have discovered some of your secrets, I'll make bold to open some more of them. But how shall I shake him off? Oh, I have it. I'll seek him instantly. Exit. Re-enter Roebuck, meeting the porter. Here, you, sir. Have you a note for one Roebuck? I had, sir, but I gave it him just now. You lie, sir. I am the man. I aren't positive I gave it to the right person, but I'm very sure I did, for he answered the description the page gave to a T, sir. Tis well I met the page, Doug, or now should I cut thy throat, rascal. Bless your worship, noble sir. Exit. At ten, in the garden, the back door open. Oh, the delicious place and hour. Soft, panting breasts, trembling joints, melting sighs, and eager embraces. Oh, ecstasy. But how to shake off love well? This is his nicely virtuous. Ha, 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 ha. This is his innate principle of virtue. <laughs> Re-enter Lovewell. How now? Why so merry? Merry? Why, it would make a dog split, man. <laughs> to watch, sir, to watch. <laughs> what of the watch? You laugh by the hour. You'll be run down by and by, sure. Aye, but I shall be wound up again. This watch I had for a fee, lawyer. Should I ever be tried before this judge, how should I laugh to see how gravely his goose cap sits upon a pair of horns? <laughs> Thou art born mad. Prithee, leave impertinence. I received a note just now. A note? Steth, what note? What do you mean? Who brought it? A gentleman. Tis a challenge. Roebuck, aside. Oh, thanks to the stars. I am glad on And you may be signally serviceable to me in this affair. I can give you no greater testimony of my affection than by making so free with you. What needs all this formality? I'll be thy second without all this impertinence. There's more than that, friend. In the first place, I don't understand a sword. And again, I'm to be called to the bar this term and such a business might prejudice me extremely. So, sir, you must meet and fight for me. Faith, love well, I shan't stick to cut a throat for my friend at any time, so I may do it fairly or so. The hour and place? This very evening, in Moorfields. Hmm. How will you employ yourself to while? I'll follow you at a distance, lest you have any foul play. Which, if you do... No, Faith, Ned, since I am to answer an appointment for you, you must make good an assignation for me. I am to meet one of your ladies at the fountain in the temple tonight. You may be called to the bar there, if you will. This watch will tell you the hour, and shall be your passport. Let me have yours. Changes watches. 
oh was that the jest <laughs> well i will answer an assignation for you sure enough <laughs> aside how readily does the fool run to have his throat cut roebuck aside how eagerly does my moral friend run to the devil having hopes of profit into wind i have shabbed him off purely aloud but prithee ned where had you this fine jewel viewing one tied to the watch Pshaw, sure, a trifle, a trifle, from a mistress. Take care, aunt, though. But hark ye, George, don't push too home. Have a care of whipping through the guts. Good, I'm afraid one or both of us may fall. But ye hear, Ned, remember ye sent me on this errand, and are therefore answerable for all mischief. If I do wait my adversary through the lungs, or so, remember you set me upon it. Well, honest George, you won't believe how much you oblige me in this courtesy. You know always I oblige myself by serving my friend. Aside. I never thought this spark was a coward before. Lovewell, aside. I never imagined this fellow was so easy before. Aloud. Well, good success to us both, and when we meet, we'll relate all transactions that pass. That you're a fool. <laughs> That you're an ass. Exeunt severally, laughing. Re-enter Lovewell, crossing the stage hastily. Mock mode in lyric following him. Mr. Lovewell, a word will ye? Let it be short, pray, sir, for my business is urgent, and tis almost dark. I'm reconciled to the squire, and want only the presentment of a copy of verses to ingratiate myself wholly, thoroughly. Let me have that piece I lent just now. Aye, aye, with all my heart. Here. Farewell. Pulls the poem hastily. Jostles out a letter with it, which Machmo takes up, and exit. Now, sir, here's a poem, which, according to the way of us poets, I say was written at fifteen, but between you and I it was made at five and twenty. Five and twenty? When is the poet at age, pray, sir? at the third night of his first play, for he's never a man till then. But when at years of discretion? When they leave writing, and that's seldom or never. But who are your guardians? The critics, who with their good will would never let us come to age. But what have you got there? By the universe, I don't know. Tis a woman's hand. Some be a do, I suppose. It jostled out of Lovewell's pocket. Wheel to the next light and read it. Exeunt. Scene four. A dark arbor in Lucinda's garden. Enter Roebuck. Oh, how I reverence a back door half opened, half shut. Tis the narrow gate to the lover's paradise. Cupid stood sentry at the entrance. Love was the word, and he let me pass. Now is my friend pleading for life. He has a puzzling case to manage. Ten to one he's non suited. We have gulled him fairly. Enter Lovewell. I've got in, thanks to my stars, or rather the clouds, whose influence is my best friend at present. Now is Roebuck gazing, or rather groping about for a fellow with a long sword? And I know his fighting humor will be as mad to be balked by an enemy as by a mistress. Hark! Hark! I hear a voice. It must be she, Lucinda. True to the touch, I find. Is it you, my dear? Yes, my dear. Let me embrace thee, my heart. Come to my arms. Runs into each other's arms. Finding the mistake, start back. It's life, a man. Death, a devil, and what thou a legion, here's a one should conjure thee down. Draws. We shall find whose charm is strongest. Draws. They push by one another. Roebuck passes out at the opposite door, and as Lovewell is passing out on the other side of the stage, enter Leanthe, wearing a nightgown over her page's dress. Mr. Roebuck! Sir, Mr. Roebuck! That's a woman's voice, I'll swear. Madam! Sir! Come, my dear Lucinda! I've stayed a little too long, 
but making an apology now were only lengthening the offence. Let's into the arbour, and make up for the moments misspent. How old, sir? Do you love this Lucinda you're so fond of hauling into the arbour? Yes, by all that's powerful. Neanthe aside. False, false, Roebuck. Oh, I am lost. Madam, do you love this Roebuck that you opened the garden door to so late? I'm afraid I do too well. And did you never own an affection to another? No. Witness all those powers you just now mentioned. Revenge yourself, ye heavens! Behold in me your accuser and your judge! Behold Lovewell, injured Lovewell! This darkness which opportunely hides your blushes makes your shame more monstrous. Leanthe aside. <laughs> Lovewell, I'm vexed is he, but glad to be mistaken. Now, female policy, assist me. Yes, madam, your silence proclaims you guilty. Farewell, woman. <laughs> what, am I made your scorn? <laughs> this happens better than I expected. <laughs> Mr. Lovewell. No counterplotting, madam. The mind sprung already, and all your deceit discovered. Indeed, you're a fine fellow at discovering deceits, I must confess, that could not find whether I was a man or a woman all this time. What? The page? No counterplotting, good sir. The mind sprung already. Ah, sir, I fancy Mr. Roebuck is better at discovering a man from a woman in the dark than you. This discovery is the greatest riddle. Prithee, child, what makes thee disguised? But above all, what meant that letter to Roebuck? Then I find you intercepted it. Why, sir, my lady had a mind to put a trick upon the impudent fellow, made him an assignation, and sent me in her stead to banter him. But when I tell her how you fell into the snare, and how jealous you were. <laughs> oh, my dear little rogue, was that the matter? Hugs her. Oh, my conscience, thou art so soft, I believe thou art a woman still. But who was that man I encountered just now? Leanthe aside. A man? T'was certainly a roebuck. Aloud. Some of the footmen, I suppose. Come, sir, I must conduct you out immediately, lest some more of them meet you. Conducts him to the door and returns. Oh, he certainly was here, and I have missed him. Fortune delights with innocence to play, and loves to hoodwink those already blind. Weary deceit can many byways tread to shun the blocks in virtue's open road whilst heedless innocence still falls on ruin. Yet, whilst by love inspired, I will pursue what man by courage we by love can do. Not even his falsehood shall my claim remove. From mutual fires none can true passion prove, for like to like is gratitude, not love. Exit. End of Act Four. Act Five of Love in a Bottle by George Farquhar. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Five, Scene One An Antechamber in Lucinda's House. The flat scene, half open, discovers a bedchamber. Lucinda in her nightgown and reading by a table. Enter Roebuck, groping his way. On what happy climate am I thrown? This house is love's labyrinth. We have stumbled into it by chance. Ha! An illusion. Let me look again. Eyes, if you play me false. Looking about. They will pluck ye out. Tis she. Tis Lucinda. Alone. Undressed. In a bedchamber. Between eleven and twelve o'clock. A blessed opportunity. Now with her innate principle of virtue defend her, then is my innate principle of manhood not worth tuppence. Hold, she comes forward. 
Lucinda comes forward, reading. Unjust prerogative of faithless man, abusing power which partial heaven has granted. In former ages, love and honour stood as props and beauty to the female cause, but now lie prostitute to scorn and sport. Man, made our monarch, is a tyrant grown, and womankind must bear a second fall. Roebuck aside. Aye, and a third too, or I'm mistaken. I must avert this plaguy romantic humour. While virtue guided peace and honour war, their fruits and spoils were offerings made to love. And tis so still. For, bow with earliest cherries, Mr.'s grace, and soldier offers spoils of Flanders lace. Ha! Huh. Protect me, heavens! What art thou? A man, madam. What a cursed spirit has driven you hither? The spirit of flesh and blood, madam. Sir, what encouragement have you ever received to prompt you to this impudence? Roebuck aside. Hmm. I must not own the reception of a note from her. Aloud. Fate, madam, I know not whether to attribute it to chance, fortune, my good stars, my feet, or my destiny. But here I am, madam, and here I will be. Taking her by the hand. Lucinda, pulling her hand away. If a gentleman, my commands may cause you withdraw. If a ruffian, my footman shall dispose of you. Madam, I'm a gentleman. I know how to oblige a lady, and how to save her reputation. My love and honour go linked together. They are my principles. And if you'll be my second, we'll engage immediately. Stand off, sir! The name of love and honour are blessed by thy professing em. Thy love is impudence, and thy honour a cheat. Thy mean and habit show thee a gentleman, but thy behaviour is brutal. Thou art a centaur, only one part man and the other beast. Roebuck aside. Philosophy and petticoats? No wonder women wear the breeches. Aloud. And, madam, you are a demigoddess, only one part woman, t'other angel, and thus divided, claim my love and adoration. Honourable love is the parent of mankind, but thine is corrupter and debaser of it. The passion of you libertines is like your drunkenness, heat of lust, as do the rivers of wine, and off with the next sleep. No, madam, a hair of the seam is my receipt. Come, come, madam, all oh, things are laid to rest that will disturb our pleasure. Whole nature favours us. The kind indulgent stars that directed me hither wink at what we are about. Twelve duty of fortune to be no idle, and she, like a true woman, once balked, never affords a second opportunity. I'll put out the candle, the torch of love shall light us to bed. To bed, sir? Thou hast impudence enough to draw thy rationality in question. Whence proceeds it, from a vain thought of thy own graces, or an opinion of my virtue? If from the latter, know that I am a woman, whose modesty dare not doubt my virtue, yet have so much pride to support it, that the dying groans of thy whole sex, at my feet, should not extort an immodest thought from me. Your thoughts may be as modest as you please, madam. You shall be as virtuous to-morrow morning as e'er a nun in Europe. The opinion of the world shall proclaim you as such, and that's the surest charter of the most rigid virtue in England is held by. The night has no eyes to see, nor have I a tongue to tell. One kiss shall seal up my lips for ever. That uncharitable censure of women argues the meanness of thy conversation. Roebuck aside. Her superior virtues always been to coldness. Slife! It can't be twelve, sure. Night's a liar. Draws out his watch. Sir, if you won't be gone, I must fetch those shall conduct you hence. Passing by him towards the door, she perceives the jewel tied to the watch. My eyes are dazzled, sure. Pray, sir, let me see that jewel. Roebuck, aside. By heavens, she is a mind to it. Aloud. Oh, tis at your service with all my soul. 
wrong not my virtue by so poor a thought. But answer directly, as you are a gentleman, to what I now shall ask. Whence had you that jewel? I exchanged watches with a gentleman, and had this jewel into the bargain. He valued it not, t'was a trifle from a mistress. A trifle, said he. Aside. Oh, indignation! Slighted thus! I'll put a jewel out of his power that he would pawn his sword to retrieve. Aloud. If you be a gentleman, sir, whom gratitude can work up to love, or a virtuous wife we claim, I'll make you a large return for that trifle. Roebuck aside. He day, a wife, said she. What's your name, sir, and of what country? My name's Roebuck, madam. Roebuck? Roebuck aside. Stith. I forgot my instructions. Aloud. Uh, um, Mockmode, madam. Roebuck Mockmode, my name and surname. Lucinda aside. Mockmode, my squire! It can't be! But if it should, I made the better exchange. Aloud. Of what family are you, sir? Of Mockmode Hall in Shropshire, madam. My father's lately dead. I came lately from the university. I have fifteen hundred acres of as good fighting ground as any in England. Aside. T'was lucky I met that blockhead today. The very same. And had you any directions to court a lady in London? Hmm. How should I have found the way hither else, madam? Aside. What the devil will this come to? Lucinda, aside. My fool that I dreamt of, I find a pretty gentleman. Dreams go by contraries. Aloud. Well, sir, I am the lady, and if your designs are honourable, I'm yours. Take a turn in the garden till I send for my chaplain. You must take me immediately, for if I call, I'm lost for ever. Exit. I think I am become a very sober Shropshire gentleman in good earnest. I don't start at the name of a person. Oh, fortune, fortune, what art thou doing? If thou and my friend will throw me into the arms of a fine lady and great fortune, how the devil can I help it? Oh, but sooner ha, tis marriage. And, but tis money. Oh, but there are children, squalling children. Ay, and then there are rickets and smallpox, which perhaps may carry them all away. Oh, but there's horns, horns. Ay, but then I shall go to heaven. For tis but reasonable, since all marriages are made in heaven, that all cuckolds should go thither. But then there's Leante. That sticks. I love her, witness heaven, I love her to that degree. Psha! I shall whine presently. I love her as well as any woman, and what can she expect more? I can't drag a lover's chain a hundred miles by land, and a hundred leagues by water. Fortune has decreed it otherwise. So lead on, blind guide, I follow thee. And when the blind lead the blind, no wonder they both fall into matrimony. Going. Enter Leanthe. Oh, my dear auspicious little Mercury, let me kiss thee. Go tell thy charming mistress I obey her commands. Exit. Her commands? Oh, heavens! I must follow him. Going. Re-enter Lucinda. Page! Page! Leanthe aside. Oh, my cursed fortune! Balked again. Aloud. Madam? Call my chaplain. I'm to be married presently. Married so suddenly? To whom, pray, madam? To the gentleman you met going hence just now. Oh, heavens! Your ladyship is not in earnest, madam. What? Is matrimony to be made a jest of? Don't be impertinent, boy. Call him instantly. Leanthe aside. What shall I do? Aloud. Oh, madam, suspend it till the morning for heaven's sake. Mr. Lovewell is in the house. I met him not half an hour ago, and he will certainly kill the gentleman and perhaps harm your ladyship. Lovewell? In my house? 
how came he hither i know not madam i saw him and talked to him he had his sword drawn and he threatened everybody pray delay it to-night madam no i'm resolved and i'll prevent his discovering us i'll put on a suit of your clothes and order pindress to carry her nightgown to the gentleman in the garden and bid him meet me in the lower arbour in the west corner and send the chaplain thither instantly exit hold fortune hold thou hast entirely won for i am lost thus long i have been wrecked on thy tormenting wheel and now my heart-strings break discovering who i am exposes me to shame <laughs> then what on earth can help me enter pendress o oh, lord page what's the matter here's old doings or rather new doings prithee let you and i throw in our two pence apiece into this marriage lottery you'll draw nothing but blanks i'll assure you from me but stay let me consider of the business no consideration the business must be done hand over head well i have one card to play still and with you pindress takes her hand you expect though that i should turn up trumps the anthe aside oh uh, no not if i shuffle right aloud well pindress tis a match be gone to the lower arbour at the west corner of the garden and i'll come to thee immediately with the chaplain you must not whisper for we must pass upon the chaplain for my lady and the gentleman haste shan't i put on my new gown first no no you shall have a green gown for your wedding in the arbour a green gown well all flesh is grass make haste my spouse fly and will you come will you be sure to come oh my little green gooseberry my teeth waters at ye exit now chance no thou art blind then love be thou my guide and set me right though blind like chance you have best eyes by night exit scene two a room in widow bullfinch's house enter lovewell brush and servant mr lyric abroad sayest thou and mock mode with him all abroad my mistress and all i don't understand this brush run to lucinda's lodgings and observe what's doing there i spied some hasty lights glancing through the rooms i'll follow you presently exit brush can't you inform me which way they went perhaps mr mockmode's man can inform ye pray call him mr club mr club what is the fellow deaf no sir but he's asleep and in bed mr club mr club club without uh yawning i'm asleep i'm asleep don't wake me up oh here's a gentleman wants ye exit enter club with his coat unbuttoned his garters untied scratching and yawning as newly wakened from bed pox of your london breeding what makes you waken a man out of his sleep that way where's your master pray sir ah oh, tis a sad thing to be broken of one's rest this way can you inform me where your master's gone my master ah uh. stretching and yawning yes sir your master my master ah oh, what o'clock is it sir i believe tis past midnight for i have gotten my first sleep ah oh. thou art asleep still blockhead answer me or where's your master ah oh, i had the pleasantest dream when you called me ah oh. I thought my master's great black stone horse had broke loose among the mares. Ugh. And so, sir, you called me. Ugh. And so I wakened. Sirrah! Striking him. Now your dream's out, I hope. Zounds, sir. What do ye mean, sir? My master's as good a man as you, sir. Dim me, sir. Tell me presently, 
where your master is sirrah or i'll dust the secret out of your jacket oh sir your name's lovewell sir what then sir why then my master is where you are not sir my master's in a fine lady's arms and you are here i take it shrugging has he got a whore abed with him he may be father to the son of a whore by this time if your mistress lucinda be one mr lyric did his business and my master will do her business i'll warrant him if of the right shopshire breed which i'm sure he is for my mother nursed him on my milk two calves suckled on the same cow <laughs> gramercy poet has he brought the play to a catastrophe so soon a rare executioner to clap him in the female pillory already <laughs> ay sir and a pillory that you would give your ears for i'll warrant you think my master's over head and ears in the irish quagmire you would have drowned him in but sir we have found the bottom on he may pass over the quagmire sir for there were stepping stones laid in his way he has got over dry shod i'll assure you pray sir did you not receive a note from lucinda the true lucinda to meet her at ten in her garden to-night why don't you laugh now ha 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 death rascal what intelligence could you have of that hold sir i have more intelligence you threw mr lyric his poem in a hurry in the park and jostled that sweet letter out of your pocket sir this letter fell into my master's hands sir and discovered your sham sir your trick sir now sir i think you're as deep in the mud as he is in the mire cursed misfortune and where are they gone sir quick the truth the whole truth dog or i'll spit you like a sparrow i design to tell you sir mr lyric sir being my master's intimate friend or so upon a bribe of a hundred pounds or so has sided with him taken him to lucinda's garden in your stead and there's a parson and all and so forth now sir i hope the poet has brought the play to a very good cata cata what do ye call him sir twas he i encountered in the garden so death tricked by the poet i'll cut off one of his limbs i'll make a sinaleffa of him i'll he <laughs> two calves suckled on the same cow <laughs> nay that i begin with you drubs him zounds murder damn me zounds murder zounds runs off lovewell after him scene three the antechamber in lucinda's house a hat and sword on the table enter rush i have been peeping and crouching about like a cat a mousing ha huh? i smell a rat a sword and hat there are certainly a pair of breeches appertaining to these and may be lapped up in my lady's lavender who knows listens enter lovewell in a hurry what sir what are you doing i'm ruined tricked i believe so too sir see here shows the hat and sword by all my hopes roebuck's hat and sword this is mischief upon mischief run you to the garden sirrah and if you find anybody secure em i'll search the house i'm ruined fly exit brush roebuck what ho roebuck ho enter roebuck unbuttoned runs to lovewell and embraces him dear dear lovewell wish me joy wish me joy my friend of what sir of the dearest tenderest whitest softest bride that ever blessed man's arms i'm all air all accoupered all wings and must fly again to her embraces detain me not my friend hold sir i hope you mock me though that itself's unkind mock you by heavens no she's more than sense can bear or tongue express oh lucinda should heaven hold sir no more I am on the rack of pleasure, and must confess all, when her soft, melting, white, and yielding waist within my pressing arms was folded fast, O oh, lips were melted down by heat of love, and lay incorporate in liquid kisses, whilst in soft, broken sighs we catched each other's souls. 
Come, come, Roebuck, no more of this extravagance. By heaven, I swear you shan't marry her. By heaven, I swear so too, for I married already. Then thou art a villain. A villain, man? Pshaw, that's nonsense. A poor fellow can no sooner get married than you imagine he may be called a villain presently. You may call me fool, a blockhead, or an ass by the authority of custom. But why a villain, for God's sake? Did you not engage to meet and fight a gentleman for me in Moorfields? Did you not promise to engage a lady for me at the fountain, sir? This Lucinda is my mistress, sir. This Lucinda, sir, is my wife. Then this decides the matter. Draw! Throws Roebuck his sword and draws his own. Prithee, be quiet, man. I've had the business to mind on my wedding night. I must in to my bride. Going. Hold, sir. Move a step, and by heavens I'll stab thee. Put up, put up. Psha! I aren't prepared to die. I aren't. Devil take me. Do you really dally with me, sir? Why, you won't be so unconscionable as to kill a man so suddenly. I haven't made my will yet. Perhaps I may leave you a legacy. Pardon me, heavens. If pressed by stinging taunts, my passion urges my arm to act what's foul. Offers to push at him. Hold. Taking up his sword. To safest making peace, they say, with sword in hand. I'll tell thee what, Ned. I would not lose this night's pleasure for the honour of fighting and vanquishing the seven champions of Christendom. Permit me then but this night to return to the arms of my dear wife, and fate and truth will take a fair trust with you to-morrow morning. What? Beg a poor reprieve for life? Then thou art a coward. You imagine a contrary when you employed me to fight for ye in Moorfields. Will nothing move thy gall? Thou art base, ungrateful. Ungrateful? I love thee, Ned. By heavens, my friend, I love thee. Therefore, name not that word again, for such a reputation would overpay all thy favours. A cheap, a very cheap way of making acknowledgment, and therefore thou hast catched, which makes thee more ungrateful. My friendship even yet does balance passion, but throwing the least grain more of an affront, and by heaven you turn the scale. Lovewell, pausing. No, I thought better. My reason clears. She's not worth my sword. A bully only should draw in her defense, for she's false, a prostitute. Puts up his sword. A prostitute? By heaven, thou liest. Draws. Thou hast blasphemed. Her virtue answers the uncorrupted state of woman, so much above immodesty that it mocks temptation. She has convinced me of the bright honour of her sex, and I stand champion now for the fair female cause. Then I have lost what not on earth can pay. Curse on all doubts, all jealousies, that destroy our present happiness by mistrusting the future. Thus misbelievers, making their heaven uncertain, find a certain hell. And is she virtuous? Sound the bold charge abroad, which does proclaim me guilty. By heavens! as virtuous as thy sister. My sister? Ha! Oh, I fear, sir, your marriage with Lucinda has wronged my sister. For her you courted, and I heard she loved you. I courted her, tis true, and loved her also. Nay, my love to her rivaled my friendship towards. And had my fate allowed me time for thought, a dear remembrance might have stopped the marriage. But since tis past, I must own to you, to her, and all the world, that I cast off all former passion, and shall henceforth confine my love to the dearest circle of her charming arms, from which I just now parted. Enter Leanthe in woman's loose apparel. I take you at your word. These are the arms that held you. Oh, gods and happiness! Leanthe! My sister! Heavens! It cannot be! By heavens it can, it shall, it must be so. For none on earth could give such joys but she. Who would have thought my joys could bear increase? Love well, my friend, this is thy sister, tis Leanthe, my mistress, my bride, my wife. I am your sister, sir, 
as such i beg you to pardon the effect of violent passion which has driven me into some imprudent actions but none such as may blot the honour of my virtue or family to hold you no longer in suspense twas i brought the letter from lianthe twas i managed the intrigue with lucinda i sent the note to mr roebuck this afternoon and i that was the bride of happy me thou art my sister and my guardian angel for thou hast blessed thyself and blessed thy brother lucinda still is safe and may be mine me she shall be thine my friend where is lucinda enter mock mode not far off then far enough from you by the universe you must give me leave not to believe you sir oh madam i crave you ten thousand pardons by the universe madam zounds madam oh, damn me madam offers to salute her awkwardly by your leave sir thrusts him back ah cousin mockmode how do all our friends in shropshire now gentlemen i thank you all for your trick your sham you imagine i have got your whore cousin your crack but gentlemen by the assistance of a poet your shealy is metamorphosed into the real lucinda which your eyes shall testify bring in the jury there guilty or not guilty enter lyric and trudge oh my dear roebuck throws off her mask flies to him takes him about the neck and kisses him and faith is it you dear joy and where have you been these seven long years zounds hold off steel iniquity to leanthe madam your pardon this indeed i won't live with that stranger you promised to marry me so you did ah oh, sir now he's a brave boy god bless him he's a whole armful lord knows i had a heavy load of him guilty or not guilty mr mockmode it is past that i am condemned i am hanged in the marriage noose to trudge hark ye madam was this the doctor that let you blood under the tongue for the quincy yes that it was sir then he may do so again for the devil take me if ever i breathe a vein for ye mr lyric is this your poetical friendship i had only a mind to convince you of your squireship now sister my fears are over but where's lucinda how is she disposed of the fear she lay under of being discovered by you gave me an opportunity of imposing pindress upon her instead of this gentleman whom she expected to wear one of pindress's nightgowns as a disguise to make the cheat more current she disguised herself in my clothes which has made her pass on her maid for me and i by that opportunity putting on a suit of hers passed upon this gentleman for lucinda my next business is to find her out and beg her pardon endeavour her reconcilement to you which the discovery of the mistakes between both will easily effect exit roebuck to lyric well sir how was your plot carried on why this squire will you give me leave to call you so now this squire had a mind to personate lovewell to catch lucinda so i made trudge to personate lucinda and snap him in this very garden to mock mode now sir you'll give me leave to write your epithalamium my epithalamium my epitaph screech owl for i'm buried alive but i hope you'll return my hundred pound i gave you for marrying me no but for five hundred more i'll unmarry you these are hard times and men of industry must make money here's the money by the universe sir a bill of five hundred pounds sterling upon mr ditto the mercer in cheapside bring me a reprieve and tis yours lay it in that gentleman's hands mock mode gives roebuck the bill the executioner shall cut the rope goes to the door and brings in widow bullfinch dressed like a parson here's revelation for you pulls open the gown oh thou damned whore of babylon what pope joan the second 
were you the priest of the poet's ordination ay ay before the time of christianity the poets were priests no wonder then that all the world were heathens how do you like the plot would it not do well for a play to roebuck my money sir no sir he belongs to this gentlewoman gives it to trudge you have divorced her and must give her separate maintenance there's another turn of plot you were not aware of mr lyric re-enter leanthe with lucinda and pendress you have told me wonders here are these can testify the truth this gentleman is the real mr mockmode and much such another person as your dream represented i hope madam you'll pardon my dissembling since only the hopes of so great a purchase could cause it let my wishing you much joy and happiness in your bride testify my reconciliation and at the request of your sister mr lovewell i pardon your past jealousies you threatened me mr lovewell with an irish entertainment at my wedding i wish at present now to assist at your sister's nuptials at my last going hence i sent for them and they're ready call them in then an irish entertainment of three men and three women dressed after the fingalian fashion i must reward your sister mr lovewell for the many services done me as my page i therefore settle my fortune and myself on you on this condition that you make over your estate in ireland to your sister and that gentleman tis done only with this proviso brother that you forsake your extravagances brother you know i always slated gold but most when offered as a sordid bribe i scorn to be brave even to virtue but for bright virtue's sake i here embrace it embracing leanthe i have espoused all goodness with leanthe and am divorced from all my former follies woman's our fate wild and unlawful flames debauch us first and softer love reclaims this paradise was lost by woman's fall but virtuous woman thus restores it all exeunt omnes epilogue written and spoken by joe haynes in mourning i come not here our poet's fate to see he and his play may both be damned for me no royal theatre i come to mourn for thee and must these structures then untimely fall whilst the other house stands and gets the devil and all must still kind fortune through all weathers steer em the beauties bloom their spite of edicts rear em vivitur ingenio that damn motto there looking up at it seduced me first to be a wicked player hard times indeed o oh, tempora o oh, mores i knew that stage must down where not one whore is but can you have the hearts though pray now speak after all our services to let us break ye cannot do it unless the devil's in ye what arts what merit hadn't we used to win ye first to divert ye with some new french strollers we brought ye bonaceres barbacolars mocking the late singers when their male throats no longer drew your money we got ye a eunuch's pipe signor ramponi that beardless songster we could ne'er make much on the females found a damn blot on his scrutchin an italian now we've got of mighty fame don sigismondo fideli there's music in his name his voice is like the music of the spheres it should be heavenly for the price it bears twenty pounds a time he's a handsome fellow too looks brisk and trim if he don't take ye then the devil take him besides lest our white faces always mayn't delight ye we picked up gypsies now to please or fright ye lastly to make our house more courtlier shine as travel does the men of mode refine so our stage heroes did their tour design to mend their manners and coarse english feeding they went to ireland to improve their breeding yet for all this we still are at a loss o oh, collier collier thou frighted away miss cross she to return our foreigners complacence at cupid's call has made a trip to france 
Love's firearms here are sent not worth a souse. We've lost the only touch hole of our house. Losing that jewel gave us a fatal blow. Well, if this audience must Joe Haynes undo, well, if tis decreed, nor can thy fate, O stage, resist the vows of this obdurate age, I'll then grow wiser, leave off playing the fool, and hire this playhouse for a boarding school. Do you think the maids won't be in a sweet condition when they're under Joe Haynes's grave tuition? They'll have no occasion then, I'm sure, to play. They'll have such comings in another way. End of Act 5 End of Love in a Bottle by George Farquhar